Day two. Oh, uh, pi. It's a pi. Yeah. Uh, uh, three one four one five nine two six five three. So ten to the ten. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I can't remember anything, but but hey, so day two. I hope everybody got some rest last night, and or had some interesting discussions, or hopefully maybe even both. Uh, I know that I was pretty damn tired when I went to bed last night. I, it was an I thought it was kind of an amazing set of conversations. A little bit of confusion, a little bit of misunderstanding, but we are here talking about consciousness, so I, mean, I would expect nothing less. Um, so I, I want to start today again by saying that, in a way, remember, and part of the reason why I'm asking everyone to try to stick to a shorter format is partially because we're trying to actually understand each other and find a way to maybe connect with each other, define these problems better, get a better frame of reference, start to sort of solidify what we're talking about. And also for folks that are viewing elsewhere, I actually got a couple of really nice messages from people saying, wow, they really enjoyed it. So, hey, let, I don't know, let's do it again today. So I, uh, I give you Julio, I think you're starting today. Yep. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to hear your talk as I'm sure everybody else is. And, you know, without further ado, I give you Giulio Tononi. Thank you, you see. Uh, yesterday, I would say, much of the conversation was about uh, what we can do as human conscious beings and what machines perhaps cannot do, especially computers. And uh, I think we'll hear from Demis, who already made his opinion known, that maybe we shouldn't be too quick in ruling out that computers can do many of the things we consider to be special about us, including insights and the like. But I want to focus instead, because my topic is and always was consciousness, on being rather than doing. Not on what machines or we can do, but what we are and what vice versa a computer is not. And so let me actually start from what we absolutely need, which is the definition of what we are talking about, consciousness. I think it fits very well with what UC said yesterday. Consciousness is experience, period, any kind of experience. Being there rather than not. And this is sort of indicator here, the standard slide. I always use, I used to have Ernst Mach drawing of himself, but I'm, this is actually somebody else, waking up from unconsciousness, from nothing and something Suddenly there is something it is like to be. So consciousness is experience. It is something rather than nothing. Okay. And that is what we want to investigate, what that means. Now the usual way to go about this is we assume there is a physical world out there, whatever exactly that is. We know a lot about it. We have made immense progress. And then we want to somehow, and that's the problem that many neuroscientists face, get consciousness out of it, squeeze consciousness out of this brain, which is this complicated machine that we are studying in better and better detail, and get phenomenology, the fact that I wake up and suddenly there is something rather than nothing, squeezed out of the brain. That is not the way to go to understand consciousness, and the position I've always taken, and that is the position of integrated information theory, which is really where all this comes together, is you have to start from phenomenology itself, from being the way we exist, and try to provide an operational account, where physical really means operational. Try to account for this out of that, okay? From phenomenology to physics. And here, without further ado, I will just say, and I know it's a loaded word, but experience what it is like to be, in a famous phrase, is a form of existence, or I would say existence par excellence. It is the only true existence. If you're gone, we you see that at the end, there is nothing at all as far as you're, as you're concerned. So this is phenomenal existence, and from within the confines, the prison, whatever you want to call it, of our own experience, we try to make up a story about what is out there, 
and then a story about what might explain the fact that we wake up and suddenly there is something and then again there is nothing. Okay? So it's not that I you know, reject realism, physicalism, atom is quite the opposite. I assume all of those things, IAT assumes all of those, but they are operational. Now operational really means that you can take a physical substance which is understood simply as anything you can observe and manipulate. And one other way to put it is anything you can play around with and get reliable and repeatable observations. In short, you can even turn it into a transition probability matrix, ideally. And here is a bunch of neurons. Of course, that's what we do in neuroscience. You go in, you observe and manipulate these neurons and try to figure out what is going on. But usually, the approach is we want to find out how the machine, the machine brain, works and then somehow maybe conscience emerges as opposed to doing what I think is essential, which is to start from phenomenology, the mere fact of existence, and ask, well, not only it is indubitable and immediately given that experience exists, and that certainly is Descartes after all, but are there some properties that are also immediate, indubitable, and true of every conceivable experience? And Basically, IT says there are five such properties, and only five. Intrinsicality, which means that experience is for the subject. It's mine, not somebody else, so to speak. Composition, every experience is structured. It has, if you wish, distinctions, things you can pick out, and relations among those distinctions. Information means that it is specific. Every experience is the way it is and therefore usually different from many possible other experiences. Integration, every experience is unitary. You cannot have an experience that would decompose into two independent experiences, otherwise there are two guys, not one, so to speak. And finally, exclusion. Every experience is definite in the sense that it has borders and grain. It sort of ends here. It's not half of what it is, the left side of the visual field only, it's not more than what it is extending behind your back. These are just examples. We could go on a very long time. I just want to say then that this is the starting point. Notice there are no other essential properties. There is no space, there is no time, there is no intentionality, there is nothing else that really is able to be essential in the sense of being indubitable and true of every conceivable experience. Given that I cannot spend any time on anything today, but I need to give you the essence of the theory, I just want to move on and say the starting point then is phenomenology, but not just that experience exists, which is the true starting point, but you don't go very far with it. You need to consider these essential properties and then you can make progress, especially if you can translate these phenomenal properties into physical properties, where physical again means operational, and where operational means you can manipulate, observe, and you derive what you could call, very generically, cause-effect power. I take a difference, I make a difference, that is what you do sort of physically. Again, I won't explain anything at all, except for saying then that translated in physical terms, existence is, I can see that something can take and make a difference. Intrinsicality, it has to be able to take and make a difference to itself, not just to something external to it. Composition is it must be able to take and make a difference in a structured manner and so we can define physical distinctions and relations where subsets of something can take and make a difference within something. Information means it's not just generic, you must specify states, causes and effects which are specifically those. Integration means that whatever you are studying, whatever you are evaluating in terms of this cause-effect power, it must be irreducible. You cannot cut it, cut the substrate, and not lose any cause-effect power because then you have two entities, so to speak, as opposed to one. And you measure the degree of irreducibility by this quantity phi, which is really a quantifier of existence. By the way, not in the Quinean sense, but it is the actual measurement of how much something is one thing rather than not. And finally, you need to find borders, exclusion. Can you find out what makes the borders of the entity what they are and not something else? And the grain of the entity, what it is, rather than finer or coarser. I just want to give you 
a quick indication here, much of the work actually about the grain has gone into demonstrating that even playing around with something as simple as logic gates, you can show that depending how you arrange them, there can be more of this irreducible cause effect power at some meso grain rather than some micro or macro grain. And then you can do all of this, of course, with these transition priority matrices. So one of the consequences of these principles that come from the only existence we know for sure exists, which is our own experience, is among other things that there is a particular grain and a particular border of the entities that should make up the neural and in general physical subset of consciousness. And in fact, the final point of the theoretical part is claiming this identity is really is an explanatory identity. As I say, we start from here, we want an account in physical terms, meaning cause effect power, and the claim is that an experience, every experience, is one-to-one -one identical to what is called a cause effect structure. That means you apply all those postulates that I showed you, you take a substrate, like a piece of brain, at a particular grain, which is, must be the grain that maximizes phi, irreducibility, existence, you unfold this substrate according to those postulates and you get this irreducible, maximum irreducible structure. And the claim is this is identical to that operationally. Okay? The nice thing about this is that you can test it. You can formulate this theory about what should account for consciousness given its properties and you can go back to the only case where we can validate a theory of consciousness which is ourselves and see whether it holds up or not. And now I want to just briefly indicate some things that we should really talk about when we talk about consciousness. That is the evidence that's there. Some very basic facts that no theory can ignore if it deserves to be called the theory of consciousness. If you cannot explain these facts, you have no explanatory power whatsoever, which is a rather important requirement in science. Whereas we know that the cerebral cortex or parts of it is critical for being conscious. But we also know that other parts, like the cerebellum, are not critical at all. You can take them out, saying it's true for the spinal cord and other pieces of the brain, completely, and consciousness hardly changes at all. You've got some problems moving around, but consciousness is not changed. Yet the cerebellum is fantastically complicated, is constituted of neurons, in fact, four to five times more neurons, 80 billion against 16 billion in the cortex, connections of all sorts, inputs from the different sensory modalities, output to the motor systems, and it's heavily interconnected indirectly to cortex. So there is nothing wrong in terms of biological complexity with the cerebellum, it just has nothing to do with consciousness. That's a fact that you must explain. If you go to cortex, and I'll show you some evidence for that, some parts of the cortex even seem to not matter for consciousness. They matter for important functions like attention, working memory, decision making, switching between one task and another, but you can cut out lots of those and consciousness doesn't really change. Okay, so why is that? If you don't have an explanation for that, you don't have a theory of consciousness. Lots of subcortical loops, lots of spaghetti-like loops that go from cortex back to cortex through basal ganglia, thalamus, etc. They are crucial for doing all the things we do every day, but again, they are not important for specifying the content of experience. Okay? Or something that you know, I've been studying for a very long time, one of the most basic things we know is you can essentially lose consciousness in some stages of sleep, in deep sleep, especially early in the night. I wake you up, you come out of something that, that was nothing at all. Okay? You come out of no existence into existence. Yet the brain is active just as much as when you were awake. By and large, throughout cortex, etc., neurons are firing. These are neurons firing throughout wake and this early slow wave sleep. This is CAT, but it's true in humans. We saw that with intracranial recordings. So why is that? Why can the same cortex suddenly disappear into nothingness as far as we are concerned? This is a seizure, a generalized seizure in a human. Neurons are firing even more. They are firing even more synchronously, and yet you are gone. There is nothing there, okay? So why is that? You need an explanation and you need a theory. And here I just want to give you a sketch of how purely from first principles, from the properties of consciousness translated into cause-effect power, into physical operational properties, you can begin to make sense of that. 
if you take the anatomy of posterior cortex, where many neurons are arranged like grids and pyramids of grids, and you unfold that kind of architecture, this is of course a trivially small model, okay, you get a big cause effect structure of high phi, which corresponds to high levels of consciousness organized in a certain way. I'll talk about that in a moment. That's really how this cortex is organized. If you go to the cerebellum, which as I said has four or five times more neurons, yeah, it's complicated, but it's arranged into a bunch of, they are called microzones, parallel circuits where there is an input going in, going through and going out, and minimal interactions among them. So you can sort of model this with minimal interaction among these sort of modular arrangements. Even though the number of neurons, the kind of neurons is similar, once you unfold, meaning unfold the entire power of the substrate, you get something radically different. Instead of one big cruise ship, you get many little sailboats or something like that. So the substrate doesn't at all in itself until you unfold its powers, what it really truly is physically, you know, it doesn't tell you what's there. And here is the same logic applied to take again this anatomy, which is typical of the cortex, change the neuromodulators the way we know quite well now. They change between wakefulness and early non-REM sleep. You do that, we have modeled this in great details, and then we have plenty of exper experimental data. You will see that what happens is that they are there, they are active during sleep, the same cortical neurons, but because of a phenomenon called biostability, the causal interactions among them break down, which is exactly what the theory predicts. If they break down, the cortex, even the back of the cortex, becomes sort of like the cerebellum, meaning it breaks down into pieces. There is not one big entity anymore, but many, many minute entities that count for basically nothing, okay, in terms of consciousness. Now, another key thing that the theory of consciousness must be able to do is not only to account for whether it's there or not and which parts of the brain somehow go with consciousness and which parts don't, it also should account for the way it feels. So not only that it feels, but the way it feels. And here are you know, four of the fundamental aspects of the way consciousness feels. These are the specific properties of consciousness as opposed to the essential properties. One is, which we tend to take for granted all the time, that most of our experiences feel extended in space, whether it's the visual space, so to speak, or the body space. We have this feeling of extendedness that is constitutive of most of our experiences, not all. How can we explain that? Okay. Or many, but not all, of our experiences flow in time. There's the sense, of course, even in language, that everything is there in a specious present, so to speak, but within that there is some ordering and it flows from sort of before to now. Or objects, that goes back to what Yussi was saying yesterday, really objects at the fundamental level to me are when we see faces, people, tables, computers, whatever, we are binding the general with the particular. The general notion, which is essentially disjunction of some sort, with the particular features, whatever that might be. And we do it all the time. This is a key aspect, but it's not the only aspect of consciousness. And finally, there is colors and sounds, etc., which is usually where people can harp on the hard problem. But really, all of these needs to be explained. And this is really the research program we are pursuing to try to account, again, from first principle, no further ingredient added for the quality of consciousness. And a work that has already been published, uh, work is going on with time and objects, this is about why it feels extended. So the conjecture we made is that the appropriate substrate for that is essentially a grid, a two-d grid, here you just see a one-d grid of units. These could be neurons, if that turns out to be the correct grain. If you unfold the cause-effect power and you get the cause-effect structure of a grid in a particular state, in this case, all these neurons are off, but they are functional, you get this, this is only a small, small subset of the distinctions, these will be the vertices and relations, they are called causal distinctions and relations, they make up this cause-effect structure, and the idea is, would that account for the phenomenology of space that people haven't really studied, because once again, because we all have it, it's not far from our nose, in fact, it's straight on our nose, when you consider how things feel, including a blank screen, including the dark sky at night, 
Well, it's just space. We think maybe there is space out there and it gets projected onto the retina and then we represent it or whatever. But just take the experience. You can dream of space. You can close your eyes and there is still space, including visual space. So an analysis suggests that the phenomenal distinctions, let's call them spot for lack of a better word, okay, are things you can pick out and you can pick out spots anywhere, so to speak, of any size in the visual field. And it turns out that you can indeed characterize some fundamental relations among spots. For instance, reflexivity. Every spot points to itself. Connection. Every spot, you can find always another spot that partially overlaps with it. Fusion. You can always find for two connected spots a spot that is exactly the union of those and vice versa. And inclusion. For any spot, you can find a spot that's larger. You can try that on your visual field, on your body, whatever it is. Now, there is perhaps some obvious resemblance here to fundamental principles in set theory, in topology, you name it. I think the direction here is we start with our own experience and then we abstract away and we develop the wonders of mathematics that we heard about yesterday, but it really starts with this and we typically ignore it. Now, can you account for that? Once you unfold the stupid little grid and you look at all the distinctions and relations it specifies in this operational way, it's actually crazy. The number of relations of eight units, eight binary units, arranged in a grid is around 10 to the 40 or so, depending exactly how you count that. So imagine a grid like what we have in our brain, the numbers are absurdly large, okay? And I won't go into this, but it's basically to show you that if you now look at these various mechanisms, neurons in a state, for instance, of their causes and their effects within the system, they satisfy, you know, these are called distinction, cause and effect distinctions, they satisfy reflexivity, meaning they overlap in full. For any distinction with a cause here, you always find a distinction that is connected to it, that is partially overlaps, where overlap of causes is a causal relation, it's zero and it is irreducible physically. You can account for fusion, you can account for inclusion, and only grids sort of can do that as opposed to some other networks, like for instance, the random networks don't do anything of the same. And you can go on, I again won't spend time, but you can then account for derived properties of the way space feels. Regions of space, they just happen to be experienced here or there. They are large or small. And all of that has a correspondent in this cause effect structure, okay? A region. It's all the spots and their relations among themselves. A location in all the spots that include a region and their relations among them. So all of that can be expressed in physical terms. Every feature of phenomenology must eventually be identical to something physical. Otherwise, it's magic and not physics. And neuroscientists treat it largely still like magic. Somehow the brain gives rise to these things. Who knows why, OK? Size, boundaries, and distances we have all the distances there. Everything, every spot is its own place. And it's its proper distance from any other spot. We don't need to compute anything. It's all there. And it corresponds to a cause effect structure here and now. That's the claim. And then, is it true? Well, if you look at our brain, by the way, we just calculated how many areas in the brain are what usually is called topographically mapped, which is basically a range-like map of the outside world. But really, these are grids before they are maps. They are, in other words, neurons connected in a near neighbor fashion, grids stacked upon grids in a pyramidal convergent divergent way. Of course, it's more complicated than that. Much of the back of the cortex is a bunch of grids, indicated here, at least 38% of cortex, which is exactly the architecture you need in order, if you unfold it, to get something that will account for space. This, again, I won't explain it, possible today, but there's a counterintuitive experiment in which we did the following. We quickly stimulated nearby spots with you know, bright light and were able to presumably strengthen the connections according to a Herbian paradigm, etc. We know in animals it works between regions of a grid, probably in primary and secondary visual cortex. So you strengthen this connection by doing this fast stimulation. Then you ask subjects to tell you how far spots are before and after this training. And the important result is here, if you actually illuminate two distant spots that you didn't do anything about before, so you didn't change connection strength, you didn't change anything, they will now, after training, feel closer. So the anatomy is the same, roughly, but you have changed the strength. 
the activity pattern you trigger in cortex is the same. So it's the same cortex, same pattern of activity, but because some connections have increased in strength as predicted by the theory, so with no change in activity, the experience changes. And more experiments of this sort should go on. Now I will very, very briefly now, because there's a lot of work in this area, move to predictions as opposed to explanations. So a lot of the work we did in the past was to use transcranial magnetic stimulation and high density EEG to test the basic idea of the theory in a very rough manner. In other words, if it doesn't hold between when you are there and you are not there, conscious and unconscious in various conditions, even in a very, very rough way, then the theory is wrong. And so this is just to show you that if you apply TMS, you perturb the brain, you record the currents that are evoked by that throughout the cortex, and then this is plotted over time in different colors. When you are conscious, they are awake, you get responses sort of all over the place lasting for 300 milliseconds or so. And when you are unconscious, instead, you get this very stereotypical response. This is in deep sleep early in the night, and the response remains local, consistent with what I showed you before. That is, the entity is not one anymore that responds in a differentiated manner. It actually breaks down into sort of local pieces, something like that. We have now intracranial evidence in humans that that is true, and in animals, importantly, if you're asleep but dreaming, like here, this is a more difficult experiment to do, you get a response equally complex as what you see when you are awake and conscious. So it goes with consciousness, not with behavior. In fact, you can try many different anesthetics. When you lose consciousness, this response becomes simple. When you, which is really only happening with one special anesthetic, which is ketamine in high doses, are completely disconnected, you can perform surgery. But notice the response is complex the same way as in wake or REM sleep, and this is when subject, when they come out, they tell you they had very long and vivid dreams. So this, again, is something that could have killed the theory, but it doesn't, and if you go over many, many, many subjects, all the conditions in which we are reliably reporting that we are or we were just a moment ago conscious, so in wakefulness, ketamine, dreaming, etc., you can quantify the complexity of the response, a little, little poor man's version of integrated information of phi, these values are high. When you are unconscious in all these conditions, from deep sleep to various anesthetics, this value is low. And this is true not just for normal subjects, it's true for neurological subjects, locked-in syndrome, strokes here and there, subcortical, cortical, or when they come out of a vegetative state. So you can actually draw a line, and it gives you, you know, the maximal sensitivity and specificity you can get with any tool right now, this knock on the brain and see how it responds based on the idea of integrated information. You can do that. Once you have validated it in us, you can then put it to work in cases where you don't really know. Minimally conscious subjects or vegetative state subjects, those that have eyes open but don't respond to anything, are they there or not, based on a theory and on a measure of validating when we are conscious or not, we can actually make inference. It turns out that a third of them or so, there's nothing there. This value perturbation of complex index PCI is zero. Some are down to levels you observe in sleep, in deep sleep, and that perhaps as persons who are candidates for waking up with some stimulation or drugs, and some are there. That's what we have to conclude. It's 25% or so. They have responses as we see in dreaming or in wakefulness, and those are candidates for brain-machine interfaces. Now, one more thing, this is not yet published, but for a few years now we have actually used the human brain project data, human connectome project data, Voxel level data, so this is very coarse, is 64,000 voxels over the human cortex. fMRI, so the time resolution is what it is, so this is all very, very, very tentative and very, very, very crude as usual, but we can actually try to measure some kind of crude phi, and I just show you that if you apply this measure to posterior cortex, the value is very, very high, this is a logarithmic scale, apply it to the cerebellum, the value is terribly low. Applied to prefrontal cortex is also low, and applied to the brain as a whole is also low. So this is a very interesting thing that suggests the theory predicts where the maximum phi is, that's where the entity that exists the most is, which should be what your consciousness is. And if you look at where this maximum is across 160 subjects, you see that it is primarily in posterior cortex. So this is just from first principles, with the due, you know, 
limitations having to do with spatial and temporal resolution and all kinds of other things. But even so, I think the rough picture emerges that there is something right about the anatomy of this posterior cortex when you're awake, say, or dreaming, such that there is a maximum of phi. There is what we call a complex of high phi, which would be the substrate of your consciousness. Is that true? This is a set of studies we did now in hundreds of subjects again, and asking what is the neural correlate now of being there or not being there by taking advantage of a very clean situation, not what, you know, awake versus anesthetized, but within sleep, that's the only state in which sometimes we are there, conscious and dreaming, and sometimes we are not there, we are not dreaming. And so it's a clean comparison because everything else is pretty similar. You're lying there doing nothing, so it's a within state, no task paradigm. And what turns out to be the case is that the areas where there is a difference, and this difference is actually delta activity, this bi-stability that I showed you before, kills causal interactions and therefore, according to the theory of consciousness, is primarily in the back of the cortex, just as from first principles. So I want to finish with, after the explanatory power, the predictive power briefly hinted at, at of the theory, the inferential power. We should go from our best theory, we should go with an inference from a good explanation, which hopefully IIT can begin to provide, and ask those difficult questions. You know, are animals conscious, animals that are very different from us, are cortical organoids, which are very critical now because they are rapidly being developed, and they show much of the anatomy, and if you wish, the physiology that we have, are they there or not? Some people think you can get collective consciousness, are they crazy or are they not crazy? And above all, what about computers, okay? Are they conscious or not, given how powerful they are? And I want to give you some of the extrapolations you can take from the theory once you assume it has been sufficiently validated in us, which is the only place where it can be validated. One, I'll mention it because I won't discuss it, if IIT is on the right track, there is free will, true metaphysical free will. I heard yesterday, as usual, People doubt that there is such a thing, but it actually directly follows from the theory, and it doesn't have to do with indeterminance, by the way. Another implication is this, that even if you were to build a, a very, 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 very good AI, as well as a computer that were able to simulate even the anatomy and the physiology of your brain in great detail, we can show that it will not at all be ontologically equivalent, but only functionally equivalent. The demonstration is actually complicated by in a trivial little system. So this is a little system of four units connected this way. You unfold this cause effect power, you get a cause effect track with a certain phi value and a certain shape. Don't try to ask what does it feel like because it's a little bit like a mini grid. This is a 66 unit computer. So those are four logic gates, these are 66 with the various you know, memory registers, the clock, etc., etc. This simulates that perfectly indefinitely, okay? You unfold this more complicated architecture and you get the little sailing boat here. It breaks down into pieces. It's just because of the way it's organized. There's nothing wrong with the computer. It does all the same things, but as an entity, its powers are, as a physical entity, are not one big thing, but many, many small things. And this can be true, of course, we can extrapolate for something much bigger that we're able to simulate the working of our brain and being functionally equivalent to us. So it's a matter of being, according to IIT, what are you physically as opposed to what you do physically, okay? That's the important part. It leads to a dissociation between consciousness and intelligence. There are reasons, I'll be happy to discuss that, to understand why in evolution, consciousness might have evolved in a way that went together with intelligence by packing more mechanism into a smaller set of units. But clearly, today, we can dissociate them if the theory is in the right track. We can get things that are pretty stupid and maybe highly conscious, say, of space, and things that are very intelligent and nevertheless not conscious at all. I'll finish with an experimental slide about the being and not doing. This is work we have done with long-term meditators in two different traditions. 
And uh, what you see here, again, I won't really explain it, is the frequency band delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. Gamma is the one that most directly goes with neural activity in the cortex. Okay? Although this is EG, it's not recording the neurons. One day we'll do that too. So what happens is we ask these subjects who have been trained to do that to enter this deepest meditation state, which is really interesting. It's a state of pure presence. Naked consciousness, naked awareness has different names in different traditions and we spend a lot of time like four years to get these guys to tell us exactly what it feels like and I agree on the terminology. It's a beautiful state, they all say so. It's a state in which there is no self, no thoughts, no object of any kind. It looks like it's just a gigantic expanse, typically very luminous, homogeneous and so on. So it's a state, they call it, of pure being without doing anything, without objects, without anything of the sort. And the prediction of the theory is that a state like that could be something having to do with grids, pyramids of grids, in a quiet state, nobody firing. Even if nobody is firing, nothing is going on, so to speak. If you unfold the causal powers of these things, it's a gigantic cause effect structure. They should feel sort of like space. In any case, what we see here is, as predicted, the deepest pure present state is a state of presumably minimal brain activity, minimal gamma. So it's a state of pure being, of not doing, and in fact of neurons essentially not even firing. I want to end with one quote that came up the other day in this context. I think it's a rather important one. This is Schrodinger saying, oh, would the world otherwise have remained a play before empty benches, not existing for anybody, thus quite properly speaking, not existing. I think he was very right about that, okay? That is not the kind of existence that only matters, the true existence, which is the existence for yourself as an entity. And I want to say that as much as we have been now primed to think of us as specks of almost nothing in a vast, vast universe over infinite time, etc., etc., and certainly there is a lot of right about that picture. If you go with this and you look for true existence, defining existence as existing for itself with all those properties, the picture changes a lot. I won't elaborate on that. But the stars collapse to dust. And us, who usually collapse to dust too, are giant stars. It really gives you a very different picture of what exists and what does not. Thank you. Thank you, Julio, uh, for the great talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, Joseph? Um, do you want to go first? Then? Demis, Demis, you know what, Dennis, I will give you first priority this morning. Joseph, warm up, and I'll give this one to Dennis. Um, Julio, you, just, you said about uh, you testing this in humans, but then you showed, I, I agree with you actually, I did my talk about the double dissociation, but you could test this in some animals then, though. Um, you, should, you should have some predictions then about mouse and maybe primates and their conscious states or not. Um, so can you, are you doing animal work? Yes, yes, we are. So I, I may or may not have a slide here. The first point to make is the theory has to be tested on us first. That's the only place you can validate it. You cannot ask, is a grid conscious, is a machine conscious, is an animal conscious, or so, before you validate a theory on us. After you validate, you extrapolate and you test it. So what we are doing, for instance, with animals, is we are applying this perturbational complexity index, which is motivated by the theory, which was validated in us in many different conditions. And then we try it in mice and rats for now, and hopefully we'll do it in monkeys, and we see exactly the same thing. So when they are awake or when they are in REM sleep and, you know, you say presumably conscious, okay, even though in their own way, we see a response which is complex. And when they are in early deep sleep or anesthesia of different kinds, they show exactly the same kind of reduction of complexity that we see in us. So this is important in two ways. One is because actually there is no good way to test for animal consciousness. Even, you know, you can discuss whether they have it or not, but all people do is, can they write themselves up or not, okay? Which we know in humans would not be a sufficient criterion. This gives you a criterion to know whether the animal is conscious or not, which is based on us and on a theory. Also, you can investigate the mechanism because with neuropixel recordings, which what we are doing, so we are recording hundreds of neurons simultaneously, 
you can actually see that when this PCI index goes down is because there is an off period. Neurons literally stop firing for 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds and we can test causally with optogenetics. It's due to a breakdown of causal interaction. So yes, you can apply to it, you can extrapolate to whether they are conscious or not and you can also investigate the mechanism of loss of consciousness better than humans. You can, you can check things like visual awareness or I mean in animals, right? There are some other things, reasonable things that you could look for. Yes, test. yes. I mean, and then the only other question I just follow up quickly was that um, are you worried that this, you know, uh, this phi measures something but it's just, it's, it's sort of correlated with the underlying phenomenon rather than explanatory of it. So you could imagine, you know, the experiment you've shown, someone's meditating, someone's imagining. Yeah. So there's more brain activity, more connectivity because of the, the, the mental task is harder. Yeah. And so, and so indeed your phi goes yeah. up, yeah. but actually it's just, it's a correlation with the fact that the more conscious task, as you call it, is perhaps more complex. Yeah, correlates with really right, Rather yeah. than explanatory. Is, is that a worry you have or? or uh, you not at all, but you know, it's typically a worry I have because people misunderstand yeah. it. In the sense that you could just say, oh, there is an interesting index that seems to work, the one that works best. It's phi, complexity, sure, that should go with consciousness, fine, okay, let's, let's just go with that. It's interesting, it works, fine. I tried, but I don't have time to do that, to say phi is completely derived from the essential property of experience itself. All the work went to the translation of the axioms, meaning the property of every experience, into postulates, that is, cause-effect power, and phi just measures the irreducibility. So it's derived from phenomenology, it's derived from the axioms. And I would also add, because it's not a typical misunderstanding, the theory doesn't just say this consciousness is a number, five, this is how conscious you are. It is a quantity, it tells you how irreducible an entity is, and therefore, if the theory is right, how conscious you are. But what it is like, as I briefly mentioned with space in this case, that is the entire cause effect structure. So all the work really is done by this giant cause effect structure that has to account for how it feels. Thank you. Joseph, you had a question? Yeah, um, it's, it's about, uh, I'm a philosopher, so it's a philosophical question. Um, you mentioned uh, Descartes, and I wanted to contrast what you say to what he uh, says, and is usually misunderstood. I, I, I wrote books about what am I in Descartes. Um, so, it, it's a question, and, and by the way, another contrast is what, what you see said yesterday which I think there's a lot of connection between what the two of you say, but he is much less subject-centered than you are. He's much more, who is manifold of all experiences, is much less making consciousness inward-looking than I think he also is. It'd be interesting to, to hear what you see himself. I'll, I'm going to speak for Descartes, I'll tell you. Okay. Yep. So, you, Descartes doesn't say, I mean, I'm not being scholarly now, he doesn't say, I feel, I have experiences. That's, that's what the common law is. He says, I think. And he says, I exist. And when he says, I exist, he says immediately part of this is realizing that there's existence outside me of which I am part, an infinite existence, in fact. So um, people have taken Descartes to be this phenomenological, you know, almost sad or something like, I exist for or something, for myself. And I, I want to lead to a question from this. Um, the question is not whether there's consciousness. The question, in some other sense, is whether consciousness is subject-centered and inward-looking, what it's like in me, or whether it's world-centered. That is, the, 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 the thing that you quoted from Schrodinger at the end is relevant, because if you think the world, so to speak, is uh, experiencing from inception, and we are just a special case of such experiences, dogs, we, um, the, the situation that Schrodinger is worried about is is impossible. Experience was there from the very beginning, so to speak, you know, as Spinoza would tell you. It's, it's not reserved to people who can talk about it, so to speak, and say, I feel the experience. It feels that when I taste sugar, it's like that, you know, which, which you kind of lead to, and a lot of philosophers lead to. So my question is, I, I think of Descartes and Spinoza as saying, it's all over, and we are a special interesting case. Um, and you seem to be saying, no, it's not all over. It started a few, you know, million years ago or whatever. And it has to do with self-orientation. So, so can, you, can you say something about it? Well, there's a lot to be said and we don't have time. So I'll just 
focus on two or three points. But you'll have more time at supper tonight. Yeah, That's we'll be, you know, I'll be happy yeah. to discuss you that. You have to say about your own view about experience. Yeah. 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 So one is, obviously this is not meant to be Descartes' position, even mm. about this, what I call the zeroth axiom. Mm. This is the position of, there is something rather than nothing, if I can, it's more Leibnizian in that sense, mm -hmm. the starting point than, you know, Descartes himself. So I, I agree, obviously I would, okay. That's not really the problem. The second issue that, that you raise about, you know, inward, centered, etc. So let's leave that. Intrinsicality just means it is for the subject. There's a lot which I haven't shown, which goes to the issue of what does it mean, for instance, to perceive an object, the usual thing that people talk about and worry about because practically that's what's relevant. And I'll just say without explaining that IAT is 100% internalist. In other words, the meaning is all in that cause-effect structure. But if you are adapted after a long evolutionary history, after development and after a history of learning okay, in your environment, then in essence, you know, it's a long story, you internalize suspicious coincidences and suspicious uh, sequences that you sample from a causal process, which we actually define quite precisely from the world, a giant, long-lasting, impossible to embrace causal process, but you internalize some regularities that matter, and then a single stimulus work as a trigger, and every perception is an interpretation. It's never, you know, a taking in in the sense of the information that's out there, is an immense amount of regularity is internalized in your brain, you get triggered by a particular stimulus. It's a long story, there's a measure for it, there's a whole issue about what causes what, I won't go into. So that's important though, and I think you put your finger on, on the right issue that that has to be explained, but I couldn't do yeah. that. Okay. And I, and let, okay? Julio, yeah. I have a, a, a quick question for you before yeah. We, yeah. we jump on, just to say that I, I think that there is in fact a lot of connectivity between the sorts of things you and me have been thinking about I think there's maybe connectivity also in terms of useful mathematical formalism and I think it has a specifically a lot to do with how what you're thinking about connects to what sort of else must be out there for any of this to be occurring yep, okay. and how little can be said of it and okay. actually still we get back in business if you like. Yep. But I have a very different kind of, a, I have two questions, hopefully very quick ones. One is that in the spirit of sort of what Ron was saying yesterday it, and we have a lot of super serious quantum and quantum gravity folks here, that do you think that there's any, any relevance, and I think maybe specifically also in terms of folks like Max Tegmark sort of trying to sort of turn your ideas into kind of consciousness as a state of matter kind of thing. So are quantum effects potentially relevant? That's one question. And the other question is more of a wish list question is that what kind of experimental apparatus would you wish for uh, to, to be able to prod the living brain, the living human brain. What would you like to know? Is it higher spatiotemporal resolution? Um, and I really mean, like, we have some experimental physics folks here, and we have some neuroscientists here behind whom there's a whole cadre of experimental physicists. We're real interested in what you, you know, what, what do you need to know? Yeah. What would you like to know? So two questions. Yeah. Is there quantum effects in the brain? What kind of apparatus would you like to have to, to pro probe deeper? Well, is there quantum effect? We'll, we'll hear that, and that is an experimental question, and I'm not going to go there. But in principle, is IHT compatible with quantum level things? Absolutely, yeah, yes. And one of the things I was mentioning before is there's actually a from first principle approach to asking what for any particular substrate, where yeah. substrate is intended in the most general possible way, stuff you can play around with, is the scale at which existence, meaning cause-effect power, is maximum, okay? Yeah. So this maximality is key. There's another connection I'll briefly mention, because I would like to discuss it with, with other people later today or tomorrow. One key quantity that we on, finally were able to prove is the unique difference measure that is justified by the axioms and therefore postures of IAT, which we recently published, called the intrinsic difference, is a quantity which is sort of like kullback leibler divergence, but really it takes into account where you exert as a mechanism maximum cause-effect power. And it's not additive yeah. always, it can be additive, typically it is sub-additive, and it finds the particular, we call it purview, end grain at which cause-effect power is maxima. This is somebody in the lab is trying to look at whether, in fact, it could be very helpful in a quantum context and, you know, with qubits yeah. and so on. So I'm smiling because I tried to do something very similar. Okay, <laughs> so there are some interesting things there. And finally, 
Spatial temporal resolution, yes, that's one great thing. I showed you the latest fMRI, which is yeah. not bad, but it's you know, one millimeter and it's you know, a few seconds. That's basically what we are playing around with. Clearly, that is not the grain yeah. at which consciousness exists in us. And then there is also a need for some smart computational power, algorithm, etc., which is just as important than the right. spatial temporal resolution. So, I mean, that's a wish list, but okay. you know, we we'll talk about We should that. talk about that yeah. more. But thank you, uh, Julia, so much. Yeah. And thank you for all the questions. <laughs> and I, uh, I give you Pava, I think, who's going to, I'm hoping, make sense of everything that's happened so far. Uh, listen, in, in a, at least kind of pull Basil into, uh, back into the fold. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And also thanks very much to the Emmy Network Foundation, University of Turku, University of Helsinki. This is like our three, three sum cooperation. So, so it's been really a pleasure and, and very happy, happy about this meeting. Anyway, so here, here it goes. Uh, I start by just with the question, is the brain analogous to a quantum measuring apparatus? If you worry about an analogies, then I'm in I, I want to show I'm in good company. We got Aristotle, Aristoteles, or Aristotle, who said that the greatest thing by far is to have a common for metaphor. This alone cannot be imported by another. It is the mark of genius, for to make good metaphors implies an eye for resemblances. This is in the poetics. Uh, also, Niels Bohr, much later, Atomic Physics and the Description of Nature, when said, Although we can be concerned only with analogies, yet in the facts which are revealed to us by the quantum theory, we have acquired a means of elucidating general philosophical problems. So this is kind of also my general approach of what you might call quantum philosophy or scientific metaphysics. That, uh, if you like, bitten by the quantum bug at some stage, and, and then you go with it for the rest of your life, even in philosophy. Anyway, so the, the question here I, I want to talk about or get started is this issue about the classical versus quantum world. It has been already discussed to some extent. And we could say this is one of the key questions in quantum mechanics. What is the relation between the classical world and the quantum world? And for these questions, the interpretations of uh, quantum mechanics differ. I'm sorry this is a bit small, but anyway, the usual Copenhagen interpretation with, with Bohr uh, the situation that actually, uh, people don't always realize, but quantum theory actually presupposes the classical level. Because remember, it's all in terms of observation, and to make observations you need a classical measuring apparatus. And you see, in this approach, as you move from quantum to classical level, some features appear, namely particles, because you don't have particles in the Copenhagen interpretation, and others disappear, like interference will disappear. Actually, Paul Feyerabend makes this point nicely in one of his articles. Now then, of course, we have the spontaneous collapse interpretations like Girardi et al, Pearl, also Penrose, and Diossi, where, to put it simply, classical object emerge through a collapse of the wave function. We got the many worlds, Everett, etc., where the world at the macroscopic level branches in each quantum measurement. So it's not necessarily that an entire universe is created. But you can also see a kind of more sober version of the Everett, which presumably was Everett's own view. And then there's the de Broglie bone, where we get classical behavior whenever the quantum potential has a negligible effect. And this is, of course, what Basil was talking about, the quantum potential. So what, here, what I'm going to be focusing is on this bowman hiley's ontological limitation of quantum mechanics. I call it BH. Uh, <clears throat> and here, of course, a quantum object, such as an electron, is a particle accompanied by a new type of field, described by the wave function psi, which satisfies the Schrodinger equation. And that's from the field we get the quantum potential. Of course, Basil does it differently these days, but still, uh, this is more like the, the, the older version. I think it's easier to stick to the older right. version. Right, right, so. over here, yeah. And so, and also one thing you notice is that the quantum potential depends only on the form of the quantum field, it's thus informing rather than pushing and pulling the particle, which is like analogous to a radio wave guiding a ship. And this is actually a scholastic notion of information as informare. And it's kind of connected also to uh, Giulio Tononi's notion of information as the difference that makes, makes a difference, going back also to the Bateson. 
Anyway, some other features is that the quantum potential between particles need not become weak as their distance increases. So we got non-locality and context dependence, again explained by the quantum potential. And the quantum potential for a many-body system, for example, in superconductivity, it, it constitutes this common pool of information that guides the particles in a holistic way. This is again something that Basil showed us mathematically, just kind of revising this. this you might say it's analogous to ballet dance, so we have quite a kind of quantum ballet where interactions between particles may not be describable by a single pre-assigned function, but there's this common pool of information. This is something actually Bohm himself felt is the most radical new feature of quantum mechanics. And finally, in certain, but this, and this will be like one of the key points in my talk, is that in certain situations the quantum potential has a negligible effect and we get classical behavior. And I'll be repeating this point, so I hope you won't get bored. Anyway, this is just a slide from Basil, which he showed. You know, in the famous two-slit experiment, the particles are coming from these holes toward you. If it was classical mechanics, they would just typically go in straight lines, right? Not like this with straight lines. But now we have this quantum potential, which you calculate from here. It's a second spatial derivative of the R, which is the amplitude. It only depends on the form, not on the size. But anyway, so that's the thing you get here. Potentials you can think a bit as mountains. So depending on the energy of the incoming electron, most of them, they, wanna go, they don't want to go up here. They don't have the energy. They like to go here where you know, it's nice and you don't have to work so much. And you can see how these two pictures go together. So no, no, nobody goes to this region where the thing is high. But they like to go into these things, and, and now we actually get an explanation of the bunching of the tra trajectory. So this is, of course, one of the selling points of the Bohm theory. We can actually give an explanation of, of the two-slit experiment, which was supposed to be impossible. Um, of course, one should, like Basil emphasized, these are hy hypothetical. Because of the uncertainty principle, we, we cannot actually observe an individual thingy. We cannot observe whether anybody is they're taking a trajectory, but at least we have a hypothesis. And with the measurements of weak values, average, the average trajectories look very much like this one. So, you know, there may be something there. And the other point people are making that the trajectories are actually, they are implicit in the Schrodinger equation. They are part of quantum mechanics if you want to have them. You don't need them, but they're there. Okay, but enough, enough of that. Okay, so let's ask this question. How does the ontological interpretation view the relation between quantum and classical world? And this is something that I pretty much I'm using. This is partly a tutorial on undivided universe because these are the, I just want to draw attention to some of these ideas. Now, the way Bohm like to put it is to say that there's a single world, what he called an overall quantum Ooh. world. There should be L world. <laughs> and in this world, you have particles and fields as in classical physics. So that's part of the ontology. But it's not classical physics because these are profoundly affected by the wave function through the quantum potential and, and the guidance condition. And, and so we get these features like form dependence, contextuality, non-locality, and organic wholeness. Therefore, this is not classical. Or, you know, people sometimes want to say, well, you know, just Bohm is just going back to the classical, but it's not like that. Now, the thing is, of course, that this quantum behavior is very different from what is to be expected classically. For example, the tra trajectories that we just saw. But again, the point when the quantum potential is negligible, a classical subworld emerges within the overall quantum world. So this is how, remember, this is an ontological interpretation, and we can add, expect from it, a, you know, like a worldview. And this is how we have to think about this. This overall quantum world, and within it, there's this classical subworld. I'm oh, sorry, you can do the point view. Now, <coughs> Bohm, of course, liked play with words, etymologies, and being perhaps a bit poetic. Uh, of course, some people don't like, but anyway, he, one of the words he used a lot is the word subtle. And, and so, and he would say that the quantum world is subtle. Why? Well, you have this kind of all the weird quantum behavior. Things like uh, quant particle interference and, and non-locality. And this is just, of course, just giving you an intuition of, of, uh, of uh, 
<coughs> something. Whereas in contrast, the uh, classical world, he would say, is manifest, something we can manipulate. This, of course, connects a bit with uh, uh, Tononi's uh, talk, because uh, for him, this is, of course, important that you can manipulate. Now, one thing to realize here is the quantum world is actually very elusive. Uh, unlike the classical world, it cannot be manipulated. If we try to hold it in a measurement, we get these unpredictable and uncontrollable changes. That's, you know, that's the uncertainty principle. There's, it's holistic in the sense that each element participates irreducibly in all the others. You remember Wheeler, the participatory universe. You have it here also in a certain way. And again, there's, you know, it's very difficult to grasp with our instruments, like, you know, it's not manifest in the same way. However, Bowman highly would emphasize it's real and constitutes a more basic reality than, than does the classical world. So this is again something where we have to learn to think in a new way. You know, the foundations of the world could be much more elusive than this thing, these things over here, which are... And of course, like uh, uh, Tononi would say, that maybe these things are the ones that have, have the exist existence. Of course, once you have a certain kind of, uh, you know, the, the, these connections. But here it's, it's not like that. Here we still somehow have to, have to uh, <clears throat> think in another way, perhaps. Okay. Now, again, the key point here is for, for this, wh where we are going with this is that where the quantum potential is negligible, we have the classical world. And it comes out of the theory as relatively autonomous whenever the Q quantum potential can be neglected. And then we can treat this classical world uh, as if it were independently existed. But again, to remember, actually, it's an abstraction from the subtle quantum world which is being taken as the ultimate ground of existence in this model, in this ontology. So if you like here, you know, John Searle, when he looked at these discussions uh, of epistemological discussions and anti-realism, he asked, does the real world exist? And here we say, yes, it does, but the fu fundamentally the real world is this elusive quantum world, but it does exist. This is the ontological interpretation, okay? And you see now, the thing here is, of course, that the classical world is extremely important. Why? Well, it makes possible objectivity and public third-person observation. And these are, of course, the things that philosophers love, logical positivists love this thing, everybody loves third-person science. You know, science loves, loves the third-person perspective. Kind of, you know, this is, for some people, this all there, all we have to worry about, so we can ignore consciousness. But, but, <clears throat> but anyway, this is not, not my view. Still, so again, in the quantum world, there's no way to obtain an objective public display of results, okay? Why? Well, because everything is so mobile, subtle, mutually interdependent. If you operate it in this quantum level, no, no way. But, as I have said many times, in the classical subworld, we have events that are negligibly affected by our measurements and observations. And then, you remember we get particles, but also fields in the classical subworld. And that's what we use to convey information to our senses in a well-defined way. So, for example, light waves, for all practical purposes, we can think of them as classical. And the same thing with ink, ink in our books and or, you know, stuff in the computers and all that. And we know of no other condition in which this could happen. Okay? So, uh, so, the, and we, so again, we could ask, so if we take things like perception and communication, and ask, are they classical or quantum? Now, of course, we know that the eye can be sensitive to a few quanta at a time, but the reception of a small number of quanta gives only the vaguest sense of optical stimulation, you know. Therefore, to have a meaningful perception actually requires a large number of quanta, which is really a classical behavior. So we need the classical world to, to, to perceive anything. The same thing about communication, which Marty, of course, will tell us later on, uh, meaningful communication between people also requires classically describable processes involving a large number of quants. So we really require, require the uh, classical level. 
So a person who is interested in, if you like, quantum consciousness or quantum mind need not deny the importance of the classical level. That's one of the points, take home messages. Now, the, so again, summarize what is the importance of the classical level? Well, the brain responds only to the states of particles and not to their wave functions. If you like, the brain typically responds to the more macroscopic stuff. Although, we'll, you know, there are some issues with that. And also, meaningful sense perception and communication has to go through the classical level in which the effects of the wave function can be consistently left out of, a, of, out of account. However, now of course the question arises, so how do we then learn about the quantum world? And, the, uh, of course, then we make a measurement. And through a process of amplification and recording in the stable structure of a measuring apparatus, the overall quantum world can manifest itself in the more limited classical subworld. So you see, a measurement apparatus in, has to have two parts. There has to be the classical, if you like, there's got to be the needle which tells us which, what's the result. This is, of course, the key problem in quantum computation because you've got to you know, bring the quantum whatever you do there into the results have to be brought to the classical domain. And, and so, uh, but then the measuring apparatus also has to have a quantum part so that it can talk to the quantum object or interact with it. And somewhere there, there has to be, it has to be able to amplify those results and it, there has to be a rec record, recording device, like some ir irreversible mark or prefer preferably, okay? And so we have this picture the, uh, of, of the, uh, <coughs> That's how we get to know. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't know there is, is, the, is the quantum world. And of course, in some experiments, okay, black body radiation, photoelectric effect, those kinds of experiments, the quantum world began to reveal itself in the classical domain. And people were puzzled about these crazy, crazy results. They couldn't explain with classical. Vision. So if you like, the classical world, of course, gives us a hint that there is the quantum world. One thing, of course, if one would, the selling point for the theory that if you, you know that in, for example, in the von Neumann's version of quantum mechanics, you actually have to assume a cut between quantum world and classical world, and that's arbitrary. If you want, you can include the measuring apparatus, then you need another one and another one. Maybe consciousness collapses the wave function, okay. But in this case, you don't need the cut. And they will say that there is actually one overall quantum world which contains this approximately classical subworld that gradually emerges under certain conditions. And this is what Bowman Heide would say, this has not been achieved by other interpretations without going beyond current quantum theory. So it's part of the game here. I think what Bohm felt very much he wanted to do with the book on the <coughs> universe. Let's see how far we can get with quantum theory without changing it. And of course, towards the end of the book, they also consider making, you know, modifying it. But a lot of the book is just saying, what can we do with quantum theory can as I it is? Can I just say that that was the second book we were going to write? That's right. But he yeah. died. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but anyway, but in some ways, I think Bohm also felt, well, what can we do with quantum theory? Let's see first what we can do with it, and then, you know. Yeah. And this is, of course, that you can have this. Now, these are interesting questions, and of course, at somewhere here, I come to the limits of my, you know, I'm a mere philosopher, so. I'm sure people here understand these things much better than I do. But one interesting thing that I can get out of reading, reading the undivided universe is that locality and separability are actually the result of non-locality. So they, they, they write that it's, you see, it's the, um, just the most characteristic quantum properties like non-locality and undivided wholeness that bring about the classical world which is locality and separability in the distinct components. So, for example, if you look at the Bohm uh, theory of measurement, what happens there is that it's the non-local quantum potential which is produced in the interaction with the apparatus and the object that will separate the wave function of the observed system into distinct channels that can be treated locally. And that's how we get our result of measurement. The particle goes into one of the channels and then you get some kind of irreversible processes, so enough degrees of freedom. It's very unlikely that it would ever come back, and that's how you establish it. But the point here is again that it, it's this uh, non-local quantum potential that, in a way, does gives you these, if you like, classical possibilities. So in that sense, it's the non-locality that is prior to, to locality. 
And the, of, of course, you want to correct me. No, I, I just say that yeah. it's the apparatus and the particles right. fuse into a whole. Right, right. And therefore, they respond together to the common pool of information. Right, right. But when, but what is it that does the uh, <coughs> creates so, the distinct channels in that well, process? Well, because you separate the channels right. and make sure they are separated from each other. Right, right. In the weak measurements, you don't allow the channels to separate. Okay. If okay. you've seen something different going on, okay. but the measurement allows them to separate, and then reversibility takes over. You've got to change everything to get it reversible. And but the channels here are parts of the wavefunction, right? Yeah, in, in, in this yeah. language, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a way of packets if you want to. Right, it. right. The options. Like if you had two possibilities, you would have two channels. Huh? Yes, and, right. and two yeah. wave packets, which yeah. are not overlapping. Right, right, right. Uh, can I ask something yeah. about that? Is non locality the, the same thing as. Uh, non do you use it in the same sense of uh, like entanglement? It's entanglement. It's the same, same in the sense right. of entanglement. Okay, thanks. I mean, non locality, in the sense of yeah, it, 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 it's yes, yes, yes. The wave function has become yeah. time, okay, wave apparatus and particle. Okay, let's see, I will say something about that. Okay. And so, now this is again an interesting, perhaps a philosophical point, perhaps even for, for the mathematicians and logicians, where there's, if there's kind of self reference, because we could say that what's happening here is that actually the overall quantum world measures and observes itself. So why? Well, the classical subworld that contains the apparatus is it's really inseparably contained within this subtle quantum world, especially through those non-local interactions that bring about the classical behavior. Because it's, it's, it's somehow what makes this, this thing possible is really the underlying quantum world. So in that sense, the observing instrument is not separate from what is observed. But still, we have this relative autonomy of the classical level, and that's how the total quantum world can manifest and reveal itself within itself in a measurement. So without the classical world, there would be no measurements in, in this, this picture. And, and of course, we already said there would be no perception, there would be no communication as we know it. But then again, of course, it's not the... And of course, they say that in contrast to the classical notion of measurement, we should regard a quantum measurement as a manifesting process. Okay, now we go to consciousness. It's a little bit my own. own uh, how much time do I have? You have a little bit more. A few, min few more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got my clock there. But Okay, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to get to this part. So here you see, <clears throat> well, as we have maybe even <laughs> said, the, implicitly here is that orthodox cognitive neuroscience typically assumes that the neural correlates of consciousness are processes which take place in the classical domain. And it's assumed that there's no need for subtle quantum effects when trying to understand how these processes function and why there is conscious experience associated with them. And now think about that in relation to what, what Bohm and Heile are saying in the book. They're saying that the more fundamental ground of existence is this subtle quantum world exemplified by the properties of the quantum potential. And my question is, why should we assume that a holistic, subtle and subjective phenomenon such as conscious experience should be entirely reducible or explained in terms of the mechanical classical domain, which after all is an abstraction from the overall quantum world. So it's kind of a rhetorical question, but it's kind of intuition that's been driving me <coughs> ever since I actually encountered these things. And this, for me, it goes back to the mid, mid 80s when, when uh, I was interacting with uh, Bohm and then later on with Haile. Anyway, so, but this is, this is kind of our, our uh, dogma or dogma, you know, the question that keeping us here. And the way, one, one uh, <coughs> question that I like to propose this is very tentative and schematic, but I'm asking that when we are conscious, is the manifest classical world being presented as a subtle quantum world? Uh, because you remember the hard problem of consciousness is the problem of explaining how and why physical processes give rise to consciousness. And I'm assuming that as long as we stay entirely within the classical domain, there is no consciousness. Nothing is conscious that is, if it's only in the classical domain. If, you know, if the quantum potential is complete in that. That's just an assumption that I'm making. And therefore I'm suggesting that consciousness often requires a certain kind of interplay of the classical and the quantum part of the brain. I'm also not assuming there's a quantum part of the brain. Uh, of course, I'm saying often there because there could be ca cases like meditation or whatnot where we don't need the classical world. 
But in most situations, like what I'm perceiving now, you know, the classical words there. And so I would propose that conscious experience typically requires that aspects of the manifest classical world are being presented to the quantum part of the brain. And if you consider perception, so we are typically perceiving the classical world. First step is through the senses, which can be explained classically. Here again, I ignore quantum effects. People would call them trivial, like what's happening in the retina. I'll come back to that. that, that but still, again, when sensory impulses are carried into the brain, many of these processes can be understood classically. So we can again grant that a lot of stuff going in the brain is in the classical domain, no problem. However, and of course, a lot of neuroscientists assume that everything interesting in the brain can be explained without quantum mechanics, okay? Now, this is, of course, a speculative assumption because we don't know. And we do have neuroscientists going back to Eccles and Beck. They suggested actually quantum processes may be important. We have now, of course, many others, Penrose, Hamro, Staff, Freeman, and Whitfield, and so on and so forth. And we do know that in the retina, already in the retinal, retinal cells respond to a few quanta at a time, which, and then there is a multiplication of their effects to a classical level in intensity. So we may not know it, but we are all walking quantum amplifiers, what, you know, the thing that's happening in our, our retina. And then you could argue that retina is just an extension of the brain. Perhaps not everybody agrees, but you know, we say that. And of course, the argument goes, or question is, could there be other parts of the brain in which such a sensitivity may exist? For example, in certain kind of synapses or even in, in the microtubules. Okay. And, and so now we come to this point that uh, if there would be this kind of sensitivity, uh, then the brain would be uh, like a uh, <coughs> measuring system that could, like a measuring apparatus, manifest and reveal aspects of the quantum world in the overall processes. And so, so in that sense, we could say that our perception or action are actually analogous to quantum measurement. Uh, the, uh, for example, then if, when I'm perceiving things, the process of perception would unfold into the brain, and then the speculation is that it would connect to this subtle quantum domain of the brain. And then this quantum domain may in turn reconnect to the classical domain, where outgoing action is determined uh, uh, through amplification of quantum effects. And this is actually a point that Bohm and Hiley make in the Undivided Universe, but they don't expand on it. And this is something that I, I'm, I like to take up and, and, and develop more. And I think it sh we should look into it. And so um, <clears throat> now, of course, we could ask some questions. So what happens when the process of perception connects to the quantum world? Is information carried by the stable structures at the classical level being presented to the quantum world? And then, does most of conscious experience arise somewhere in the process where the classical process connects to the quantum domain? Remember, I made the assumption that if you're staying entirely within the classical domain, there's no, gonna be, not going to be consciousness there. So I'm just, you know, and of course, this would lead us to a possible solution of the hard problem of consciousness. And, and so we could ask this question like, uh, <clears throat> how does conscious experience arise? There is a suggestion of connected bone theory by Jack Sarfati. He has many wild ideas, but this is one of the, not perhaps, well, it's a wild, but it's not equally as wild as some of the others. <laughs> yeah, I know. But anyway, he suggested that so called back action would play a key role in how conscious experience arises in the context of the bone interpretation. And as you can see, we have above said it's the wave function influencing the particle. But if the field influences the particle, might not the particle influence or act back upon the field? This would be very much in, in line with principles of physics. And so, uh, actually, this is something that Bohm himself considers already in 52 and Bohm and Hiley in 93. And, and so, uh, we could say that, you know, we, we use the notion of informing there. Could there be a, a kind of equally subtle effect when it comes to the back action? And what Sarfati has proposed is that, that, uh, <clears throat> that this uh, qualia would be some kind of excitations in these macro quantum coherent pilot waves. The pilot wave is another term of, of this quantum field in the bone theory. And so the assumption there is that we got something intrinsically mental, namely this uh, quantum information field, 
and then our qualia would be excitations in them imprinted by the back reaction of the classical material variables. So again, we have the classical world exciting, if you like, this quantum domain. And anyway, so this, is, uh, this does connect to the Frelick thing. I'll, I'll, I'll move on here. I didn't say any, everything here. There is some controversy about these Frelick states, which are these, the macroscopic quantum coherent states in the brain. But there is some recent research suggesting that actually the group in Gothenburg claims to have observed for the first time a quantum coherent like state. And there's some other connective work there. And of course, the, uh, <clears throat> so it's just one idea. I mean, I don't, you know, it's just to get started really here. But this would be one suggestion how classical processes get, become experienced. And of course, right now when I'm observing the environment, I'm observing the uh, microscopic world. And somehow, if there would be some kind of back action making me conscious of it. But still, still the, uh, <clears throat> the some final point just is that, of course, we are typically conscious of an entire virtual world, perhaps produced by the brain analogously to the way holograms work. This is, of course, the pre Brahm idea. So it could actually be that uh, what is being presented to the quantum part of the brain is this 3D classical construct. And, and we don't know the mechanism, but anyway, this, this, is, this could come into it. So anyway, here, here's, the, uh, here's the summary, summary of, of uh, <coughs> what I've been saying. And uh, perhaps finally, it's just the, to come back that the, the, the suggestion that the brain would be analogous to this quantum measuring apparatus. But I think I, I won't go through all of that because of the time constraint. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Could I make a comment? Yes. To begin with, as it's been plagiarising, <laughs> oh, no, advertising our work. Well done, Pablo. I think at long last I don't have to worry about you understanding what we were saying. <laughs> You've got it very well, except for the last little bit. Right. The back reaction. Right. What do you think about back reaction? I, it's a different type of force, which is what I tried to say, but you probably got lost in my talk. Right, right, right. right. It's, it's the force which is the force from within. It's the Coriolis force. It's the Magnus of force. Uh, force which keeps aeroplanes flying. There's no back reaction right, right, in right. that. So there's a different quality of force. And but, that we, but we could have another way in which the, if you like, the quantum level would be sensitive to the macroscopic world. Of course, we do have that through the boundary conditions, like in, even in the two slit experiment, it's the classical yeah, it's, environment that will... But it's will, through the quantum potential that's right. doing this. This is why I wanted to, in my talk, to justify the quantum potential was not our invention. It's right. the essential feature right. of all of physics. Right. But it responds but, to the classical environment, right? Well, I don't, I don't look at it as classical. Yeah, I, think, but I think the idea is maybe that there is this one environment, yeah. collectively. You see, because yeah, I, I, can I just have a few, few minutes? I, I, I thought very much that we could think of uh, this. We don't need de decoherence. At least I've got one example which doesn't need decoherence. And so that's what worries me, that, and I don't know quite what to do with it, but I was watching uh, Formula One racing, and there we have the curse process, which is very interesting. Where you store the and you break, you store the energy in the battery, and then when you accelerate again, not only do you use the petrol, you also use the quantum potential is very much like a store of energy, mm -hmm. which you take from the classical quantum uh, kinetic theory. Mm -hmm. and put it in a store somehow. And this is the, the, the idea of the non-local energy. It's not pinpointed. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes, and during the interference effects, it's that extra energy is, as it were, guiding in the, in the language that uh, Paolo was using, the particle. And that's what makes those trajectories look like that. Now, I thought, well, OK, what happens if I put my quantum particle on top of a upside down, I think about the inflation, which I know we're just doesn't like, but it's a, it's a lovely potential, okay, which you don't, normally we have it this way, let's have it that way. And you've got a, uh, a, a Gaussian wave packet on the top there, and then you let it fall. It accelerates, accelerates, 
And if you work out the trajectories, mm -hmm. they actually become classical. Mm -hmm. So you can actually go from the quantum trajectory into the classical, no decoherence, but it could be somehow due to this mass effect, you're increasing the mass of the particle. In this case, you're increasing the speed of the particle, but Borja wants to say you increase the mass of the particle. So that's another possibility. How we do it experimentally, I don't know. But you see, that there's no difficulty in that at all. No difficulty. No. So don't yeah, always go for so it. Yeah. Technical appearance is important. Please don't get me wrong. No, no, I understand the point. Yeah. I, yeah. Demi's had a question as well. Yeah, yeah. Quick question. Thanks for coming. It's a great talk. Yeah. Um, so this irreversibility that you talked about with the quantum against the classical, I just struck me as having the right kind of properties to explain direction of time. Is there a sort of relationship between that? We, I think people have uh, sometimes used that, that uh, as, as one of the something. What happened? I mean, some people would say it's a collapse of wave function. You might also do it, do it that way, but that, that would be a bit like a thermodynamic. Uh, then, uh, then you have to go to thermal quantum field theory mm -hmm. to right. really appreciate right. where that's coming from. Yeah. That's another lecture. But, yeah. but, but it's definitely you can it's definitely access it. You can definitely yeah. access it in this kind of a model. Yes. You can also then this access it in the kind of models yeah. that I propose. Yeah. Yeah. But you can make modelizations where there is directionality mm -hmm. and modelizations where there's reversibility and no. Well, it seems like there's yeah, it's been going right, the directionality. Yeah. But but in a way, in a way to exp perhaps still say something about the motivation of, of this of my, my talk is that that the bone in the bone theory as it is, we, we talk a lot about how the quantum potential organizes physical process. But in some sense here, like with consciousness, we're interested in, well, how does the physical world and the manifest classical world get experienced by us in consciousness? And that's, and if we do believe that the quantum potential is involved in those processes, then the, the idea of, of some kind of back action, it could be something else. I mean, I, I, I don't have strong opinions yeah, no, about it. I think it, there is, but we, you it know, could possibly like, be something, but we That's don't, right. The bone would call it so much. Bone would call it some uh, significance or some kind of where the ma somehow, if you like, the magic of perception is that we are able to become conscious of, like in this case, of, of the environment. And if we seek like a physical explanation of that uh, through quantum mechanics, then, then we would need not only from, from quantum potential to manifest particles, but also from the manifest world back to the quantum world, if you like. I have one question. Right. Um, is, it, is it okay? Anybody else? Well, uh, I just one contact. Don't forget, when you go to field theory, you get the super quantum right, right, right. right. The whole hierarchy. Yeah, of that's right. Uh, Joseph, you had a question. So, to Paul. Yeah. Well, what's the difference for you between consciousness and perception? Why is it all the consciousness at the end of perception? Well, of course. We can be uh, conscious of our thoughts. I mean, usually we say perception and cognition. So you know, we, we might have non-perceptual conscious events. So consciousness would be the broader category. I mean, we usually say, philosophers say, there's a difference between perception and intellection or con conception. Right. But wh why isn't consciousness? And so I'm aware of the distinction. But why isn't it that there's perception, and sometimes I perceive you a classical world? And sometimes I perceive myself, not just my me, but as it were, things inside me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. no, because a lot of what you say is leading there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, yes, I would, because that's, I had to qualify, of course, that there are cases of conscious experience where we don't need the classical world, it's the internal aspect. But of course, typically when we are perceiving, then typically what we do perceive is the manifest world, and we do not perceive the quantum world directly. So. But you, you see so, that? Yeah, I, so I have a, I'm going to ask for the impossible. I'm going to ask a really tricky question and I'm going to ask you to answer in two seconds so that <laughs> right. we can move on to Stuart. But here, here's the, it's sort of also a proposal for everyone here. Is I think, you know, there's a, a pro, sort of a model of consciousness proposed by Chalmers there on, on the board. And Pablo, you're talking in this way where you say, hey, I'm going to take my ontology to be sort of this Bohmian quantum world. As far as I understand the Bohmian quantum world, there still are, let's call them like, non-temporal processes happening in it. 
in the way that needs talking about. You know, there are different proposals for it. Time might not be defined, you see, because no, it's uncertainty. I, I, I know, exactly. So, but, so here we are. So in the way we have sort of a, you're leaning on a, kind of an ontology that itself still is unresolved. Rogers made proposals about how yeah. to extend it. In the way, actually, the whole Bohmian interpretation is a proposal of that. But I, I want to I wanna think, I wanna think, make things harder still. So in a way, we also need to be able to, in our thinking about consciousness, so sort of if we think about the I poke at something, it reacts and it does something, sense, well, there's things like, you know, Hugh here. Gosh, you, you poke at Hugh and, you know, he comes up with the, you know, solution to CH. It's unclear to me that that conception that Hugh is holding can actually be meaningfully discussed as some kind of a submodelization, let's say in the Bohmian or even the extended Penrosian kind of conception of the world you've made. So I would just say in a way that a big part of what I, what I was saying yesterday has to do with these types of challenges. So it's of course conceivable that no really, Hugh is just really carrying out these physical processes and it, he's sort of pitching us something very fancy, but it isn't really there. But that seems unlikely, just the same way as it seems unlikely that you know, the LIGO experiments are figments of our imagination. Right. So what, one thing is a proposal to all of us, and then in this world that you talk of now, how do you see, you know, so to connect to Julia, this is a question for both of you, is that, so actually, I, I think maybe Julia might think that maybe you could have classical system where there's consciousness connected to a quantum world, but how do you see the connectivity between, so can the Tononi IIP model live in a sort of a Bohmian universe? Does that make yeah, does yeah, the question yeah. well, make sense? Well, I, I just say just that, uh, of course, here I personally didn't make it clear enough, but in, in some ways I think uh, the aim of Bowman he worked this thing out was to, at least the earliest part, was to see how far can you get with quantum theory. Yeah. And Bohm would have been the first to emphasize that quantum theory is limit, still limited. It, it won't be, so it probably wouldn't be able to discuss the, the kind of things that, uh, that uh, but of course, Bohm also had a more general uh, uh, philosophical ambitions, and that's where the implicate order framework comes out. And in there, I presume there would be room for, for the you know, mathematics or, or, or perhaps IIT in a different way. But this is more just like, like looking at that what, is, what is quantum theory if we don't change it? What is it trying to tell us? Yeah. And there are going to be limits. And of course, we're stretching it if we're trying to say, could we use that to say something even about consciousness? Yeah. And take the David Chalmers in double aspect theory of information like that. Yeah. But, you know, but I don't know if, if uh, Julia has something. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So there can be classical consciousness, right? Is, or, it, or, or sorry, the you can live in the Bohmian universe. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Guys. So, you know, in this uh, train driver conductor role, I give you Stuart Hammerer. Hold for a second. Let's who, you who will hold for one second. So, I'm gonna go get a quick coffee, and then we continue. You okay, Roger? Should we wait for you? Water? Yes. Maybe I, will be, I, I will be back before you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to stop <laughs> Just a minute. No, you can uh, get my next buffet. Just my next ten Okay. Do you, do you live in Arizona? Arizona is yeah. Tucson.
I haven't been for a long time. Oh, she can. Well, we're having a little bit of the people are coming on. Right now, hybrid, so both online and online. We need to run tacit. Okay, got it. Yona, you need to do that. 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 Me puedo va aquí mo mena cama. Let's take ten so that we can get some. Yeah. 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 I think it's uh, yeah. it's I think it's got more. So I'll go I'll go with him. Yeah, but yeah. And then we'll come back some. Where we're coming from, it's not that we're rivaling you, because we don't know what the answer is. And there's many different views that we have. Not, not, I don't like the American style. You, know, you don't believe my I'm not going to talk to you. That's the truth. Yeah. This is your. Okay, I, I feel some difficulties, but no, let's, let's talk about it. And in fact, Roger is suggesting that maybe our group can do some experiments with some beautiful apparatus where we. We're producing interference fringes of individual helium atoms, individual argon atoms. So we're looking at it, and we're wondering if we could use the mass idea on our experiments to see if we, so we don't have to wait as long. I mean, the boys have done a brilliant job. I mean, if you like to see, I've got a movie of, of the atoms actually arriving, forming an interference pattern. One atom at a time. No. They come through one at a time. You can actually see them. Just one atom come through the first time? Yes. Well, if you want to see it, do see it because it, it, it's quite mind boggling. You know, you always think, well, it's the whole group that's causing it. No, it's not. It's a bloody individual. That's the whole point of my talk. <laughs> so, this is one way of looking at it. Rogers is the other way of looking at it, but the interesting thing is how I come back and I re-derive Rogers' spinners from an entirely different point of view. And there are many ways for us to see this. That's why I'm excited still. Anyway, you've got some.
Once again, I give you Stuart Hameroff. So uh, let's do it. Thank we you. Are back in action. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to talk uh, about how Orkowar can rescue conscious free will. Orkowar is the theory of consciousness that Roger and I developed in the middle, uh, mid 1990s. And here you see uh, part of a multi scale hierarchy that kind of comes with it. And uh, we start with a neuron. And if we went that way, four orders of magnitude larger, we'd get to the brain. If we go this way, we go into the microtubules, the individual tubulins, which are part of the microtubule, uh, dipole oscillations in aromatic uh, rings, and then way, way, way further down, we get to the Planck scale where, uh, where Roger's objective reduction uh, originates, and I'll come back to that. So, um, help. Oh, just round slide. Okay. No. No, I'm stuck in a loop. Sorry, it's the that one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry about the remote. Yeah. All right. So I want to talk about conscious free will, which is difficult to explain for a number of reasons. First of all, we don't understand consciousness. Well, some of us think we do, or we might, but basically the exact mechanism is unknown. It's the hard problem. Second is determinism. 
Uh, classical physics tells us our actions and the world around us are algorithmic and inevitable, and no matter what we do, it may have always been uh, programmed that way by everything else. Um, but putting that aside, the main thing I want to talk about is that consciousness apparently occurs too late for real-time conscious perception and response. Consequently, the common assumption is that consciousness is epiphenomenal and illusory, and that free will, at least for real-time conscious events, is impossible. That's pretty much the party line in neuroscience and philosophy. And we can address this through the perception action cycle, where we have inputs over here, uh, coming in from the spinal cord and going up eventually to the, uh, the brain and uh, causing some action which can also uh, occur lower. So you can have spinal cord reflexes that never go to the brain, qu quite literally the knee-jerk reaction or anything. Uh, but at the very top at least, and maybe lower, we have consciousness, conscious uh, perception and conscious action. And this is what we want to address. And mostly uh, perception is in the back of the brain and uh, uh, action in the front. And where consciousness is, we'll come to. Now, conscious uh, perception, for example, for vision, uh, involves three waves of uh, post-thalamus. So from the eyes, uh, inputs come to the thalamus, spinal cord to the thalamus. All the senses except for smell go through the thalamus. And for vision, at least, uh, the uh, uh, primary visual input goes to the back of the brain, to V1. And then the second wave goes feed forward to the front of the brain. Uh, uh, shape, color, motion, meaning are integrated to the front of the brain, for example, prefrontal cortex, and this uh, radiates the third wave, and it's the third wave that's conscious. And we know this for a couple of reasons. Number one is that only the third wave is inhibited by anesthesia. This is a very strange effect because the neurophysiology is very similar um, with all different types of anesthesia, the gases, uh, propofol, and ketamine. And this work was done by George Mishore's group. So only the third wave is, uh, is affected by anesthesia. And it occurs hundreds of milliseconds after sensory input. So this is strange. Consciousness occurs uh, three to 500, or the activity that correlates with consciousness occurs three to 500 milliseconds after sensory input, Bing. So I'll use Bing to in indicate consciousness uh, uh, experience, the so-called hard problem. Now how that arises is what we have to explain. So being a, uh, the activity associated with being occurs uh, uh, almost a half a second after sensory impingement. And this is consistent with theories of consciousness, in, including our own, that, that the activity associated may, may occur then. And, and the other uh, theories, global neuronal workspace, higher order thought, uh, predictive coding, <coughs> recurrent processing, Julio's uh, IIT, and ORCOR. Now, the, as I said, the issue is that the activity occurs uh, three to 500 milliseconds afterward, afterwards, and yet we respond to visual inputs in less than 100 milliseconds or even faster, seemingly conscious. And Roger was talking about Roger Federer. This is uh, Rafa Nadal uh, 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 hitting a shot. And uh, we know we respond even in rapid fire conversation uh, at a cocktail party or elsewhere, we, uh, we, we respond more quickly then it seems that the, the, what we're responding to has been processed. According to mainstream neuroscience and philosophy, started by Dennett, uh, Dan Wegner, etc., cetera, um, <clears throat> consciousness uh, and, and the other theories, and maybe Julio can respond about IIT, consciousness comes too late. Consciousness comes after we've already responded non-consciously. So consciousness is considered epiphenomenal and illusory. We are merely helpless spectators, kind of like Pac-Man being manipulated around the, the game by somebody with the joystick. In this case, the joystick is controlled, presumably, by non-conscious processes. And consciousness is considered epiphenomenal and illusory. Uh, we'll come back to that point. I don't think it is. Uh, but we can, to uh, get there, we can ask, why is the third wave conscious? What's so special about this third wave? And the third wave goes into uh, the cortex. And the cortex, cerebral cortex, is, uh, consists of uh, six layers. You see it here, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And the thalamic inputs or inputs from other areas of cortex uh, go to first layer four, and then from layer four, they go to one, two, three, and six. And then one, two, three, and six converge on these layer five pyramidal cells, these very large pyramid-shaped uh, neuronal cell bodies, which are extremely important. 
and they're important for a couple of reasons. The apical dendrites that arise from them go to the surface, and because they're vertical, they don't cancel out and give rise to EEG. So what we measure as EEG at the surface comes is the summation of these apical dendrites coming from the uh, layer 5 pyramidal cells. Uh, the lateral dendrites, the basilar dendrites, make networks that spread over the entire uh, cortex in one continuous sheet. And the axons coming out go directly to the pyramidal tracts of the spinal cord to move our, our muscles to, to say what we're going to say. So this is the primary output uh, from the uh, cortex to the, the body to do what we're going to do uh, by these uh, axons coming out of there. And then the, plus the fact that the uh, pyramids themselves are the largest uh, cells in the brain. And therefore, it's, it's likely, I think, that this is where uh, consciousness occurs uh, in, the, in this lateral network covering the entire brain of the uh, pyramidal cells. Now, if we look at them closely, they're very interesting. As I said, the apical dendrites give rise to EEG. The microtubules inside them are in a very interesting uh, arrangement of, of being interrupted and of mixed polarity. Uh, microtubules are part of the cytoskeleton, and if you wanted a skeletal support, you wouldn't break your bones uh, uh, in your leg, for example. So there must be some other reason why they're short, interrupted, and of mixed polarity. If this one's pointing up, the one next to it's pointing down, and so forth. And we think that's to promote interference patterns. We'll come back to that. The centriole and centriole barrels, one of these comes out and sticks out as the primary cilium. The basilar dendrites connect to other uh, basilar dendrites in this uh, layer I was talking about, and the axon goes down to, uh, to the uh, spinal cord. And the transition of where the axon, the firing starts is dependent not on whether it's in the axon, but where the microtubules within the axon change from this mixed polarity network uh, to, the, to a continuous uh, arrangement. So um, here it is again, and uh, the layer 5 pyramidal cells and their dendritic connections form a horizontal network, which give rise to interference and oscillations. This was suggested by Carl Prebrun, who was mentioned earlier, as the origin of a conscious hologram coming out of the interference patterns in this lateral. Stuart, can I just, is, is that well accepted now, that, that idea of Carl's? Uh, no, but he suggested it, and I think he was right. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to hear. Um, so, what happened here? Uh, sorry about that. It's uh, dropping out. If you press uh, that button, this one. it's pressing uh, uh, dropping away. So now the arrows uh, should work again. Go back to the arrows. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the final point about this is that there are no pyramidal neurons in the cerebellum. So Julia was, was claiming that IIT can explain uh, the fact there's no pyramidal neuron, uh, that uh, the cerebellum is not conscious, but it could be that uh, there's no pyramidal neurons and you need pyramidal neurons for consciousness. So uh, pyramidal neurons are neurons, which means they are considered Hodgkin-Huxley neurons. So in their subbody and dendrites, they receive inputs, uh, integrate to a uh, threshold roughly here, and that fires to the uh, distal axon, uh, mediated by ion channels, integrate and fire. And this was described by Hodgkin-Huxley in the 50s, integrate and fire. And uh, um, this has been used to uh, uh, build uh, models uh, that uh, neurons are, are like computers or uh, components of computers uh, based on Hodgkin-Huxley threshold logic integrate and fire neurons. Um, however, this is algorithmic, uh, deterministic, machine-like, machine -like, and comes too late. And there's no room or opportunity, it seems, for consciousness, creativity, intuition, insight, or free will. It's just a, it's an autonomic uh, autopilot type system without any apparent opportunity for consciousness. So uh, Hodgkin-Huxley activity is predicted uh, by this type of graph where you have the integration and the firing uh, is sloped because it's thought to be to sequential opening of the ion channels. So you can look at it as a very narrow threshold for, of the potential and a very narrow firing threshold. And this would be a, a, an algorithmic uh, Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. However, in 
actual neurons in awake animals, this was observed in pyramidal neurons, the same pyramidal neurons I've been talking about, in awake cats, what you see is quite different. There's a very broad uh, firing uh, threshold shown here. So there's a big temporal window and a wide threshold. So there's some non-computable factor regulating the axonal firings, uh, such that they're not completely algorithmic and deterministic. And uh, this is a likely place for consciousness to come in. You can see Bing here uh, with the wide uh, temporal uh, variability and threshold. And uh, the, the, the spikes are vertical, which means that these ion channels, at least a bunch of them, open simultaneously. So it's not it's open, open, open. It's, they're all opening at the same time, which is suggested to be a quantum effect also. So this is a likely place where consciousness can regulate behavior from a deeper level, you could say, from where? Well, the most likely place is from inside the neuron, where we have the microtubules and the other cytoskeletal protein, which is uh, where Bing is likely to occur in the cyto cytoplasm, regulating and altering the integration and triggering firing. This is somewhat like deep learning uh, networks in AI, except they have an additional network. And here, the network is at a smaller scale uh, inside the, the system. And I should add that the microtubules, uh, when they fall apart, you get Alzheimer's disease. Now, most people think about the uh, amyloid plaques, which are outside the neurons, but the real lesions that correlate with lack of cognition, lack of memory, are the neurofibrillary tangles where the tau protein falls off the microtubule, and the microtubules disassemble. Uh, you lose synapses, the whole neuron shrinks shrinks, and uh, this is something we're actually trying to address clinically. So um, microtubules, um, I got interested in them in the early 70s and, uh, and in mitosis, and they were dividing chromosomes and pulling them apart and separating them perfectly. And uh, how they did that, nobody knew. And when, I, when their structure was developed by Amos and Klug in, in the UK to see this lattice of individual tubulin proteins, in hexagonal lattice with, and this is the A lattice, with Fibonacci geometry, uh, it occurred to me that maybe uh, each of these was like a bit in a computer and the microtubules were acting like computers. So I spent uh, some time and, and wrote a bunch of papers modeling microtubules as classical computers. Uh, but then one day, and, and this increases the capacity for information in the neuron in the brain tremendously because there's about 10 to the 16th potential operations per second per neuron based on these tubulin switching at 10 megahertz. And uh, <clears throat> then somebody said to me, well, let's say you're right. How would that explain consciousness? And kind of threw the hard problem in my face, even though it hadn't been quite invented yet. And I admitted I didn't know. But fortunately, that person suggested I read Roger's book called The Emperor's New Mind, which I did. And he had a potential solution to the question. So. Um, uh-oh, did I do it again? <coughs> Go to the arrow? The arrow. Okay. So I read Roger's book, The Emperor's New Mind, which I would recommend to everybody. And uh, as he said yesterday, uh, it, it, the question he addressed, among others, was his consciousness computation. Through Gödel's theorem, he said uh, consciousness is not algorithmic and hence non-computable. Some other factor was required, and uh, he saw a potential source of this non-computability in the unexplained quantum state reduction or collapse of the wave function, the measurement problem that Paul was talking about, and that this was due to an objective threshold related to quantum gravity, uh, in turn related to fundamental space-time geometry, which called objective reduction OR. And he began by addressing superposition. Nobody had explained how something could be in two or more states or places at the same time. And he turned to uh, Einstein's general relativity where mass is, was equated to curvature in space-time, usually for big objects like the sun, which allowed it to be measured. Uh, Eddington uh, saw these stars that were here, over here, and confirming uh, Einstein's theory. Roger applied it to small things, uh, equated quantum particles with tiny space-time curvatures, at tiny scales using these two-dimensional two space-time sheets where a particle, a quantum particle, would be a curvature here, and if it moved, it would be a curvature here. So an oscillation between two positions would be an oscill oscillation of the position of the 
space-time curvatures. And if <coughs> a superposition would be the curvatures in, in both places at the same time, so you have two curvature and the same particle in two different locations, so separated space-time curvatures. And here it is again, separated space-time curvature, uh, curvature as uh, a representing superposition. Now you might imagine that if these separations of, uh, were to continue, uh, you'd have multiple worlds. Each, each, uh, each curvature would branch off and form its own universe, and this is a very popular idea in physics. Uh, the other approaches that we heard about, uh, von Neumann, Wigner, Stapp, Chalmers, and McQueen, uh, more recently say that consciousness causes collapse, consciousness causes quantum state reduction, and I call this subjective reduction, because here's a conscious entity, Bing over here, although we, it's not explained how or why there's consciousness here. And this uh, 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 observation causes uh, one of these curvatures to, to stop, to disappear, and one to continue. So this is subjective reduction, or the, uh, sometimes known as the Copenhagen interpretation. But Roger said rather than that, that these separations are unstable and will self-collapse, undergo objective reduction at a time t, given by h bar over e sub g. h bar is the Planck Dirac constant. e sub g is the gravitational self-energy that he described yesterday, pulling uh, something, either the matter or uh, space-time from itself, occurring at time t equals h bar over e c g, resulting in a causal moment of conscious experience, bing. So rather than consciousness causing collapse, collapse occurs spontaneously by this space-time property and uh, causes consciousness or results in consciousness. And this is causal. This is uh, one thing is selected over another. So this is uh, a, a causal action uh, resulting in a moment of conscious experience. So rather than consciousness causing collapse, collapse causes or is consciousness. So just to distinguish, here's subjective reduction and here's objective reduction. Bang. Now in the random microenvironment, uh, which could be the same as decoherence, such events would be isolated and lack meaning and context, uh, they would be considered proto-conscious. Uh, and possibly analogous to Whitehead's simple occasions of experience, uh, philosophy. Uh, metaphorically, this could be likened to notes, tones, and sound of an orchestra warming up, a cacophony. So you have little moments of proto-consciousness here, there, and everywhere, but you want is for the symphony to begin and something to integrate and to orchestrate all this into something more like music. So how could they be organized, orchestrated in the brain for full, rich, conscious experience? Um, Roger needed a quantum computer in the brain which could orchest biologically orchestrate quantum information, halt or terminate by Penrose OR at a time t equals h over e sub g, connecting to uh, non-computable platonic values and qualia, and regulate functional neuronal and synaptic activities. Well, uh, microtubules, it seemed to me, were a potential answer, and I suggested it to him, and he agreed, as we heard yesterday, and uh, the rest is more or less history. And uh, uh, the idea is that the microtubules inside are, are affecting uh, uh, the uh, integration and threshold firing. We don't see the axon in this one. So uh, the question was, what was the qubit in Orcoar? And uh, uh, we, to do that, we went into the tubulin molecule. And so each of those peanut-shaped proteins we saw earlier actually has 86 pi, uh, pi resonance rings, organic rings, and three, three types of aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. So there are 86 of these in each tubulin. And here we see them in the, the red spheres that were anesthetics bind. And we think that's how anesthetics act is to inhibit these quantum vibrations in these things. And uh, 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 this was, we published this in 2012, and I'll come back to that point. But to come up with a, a, a simplified model, uh, we, took, uh, we took the 86 and, and made uh, several possible dipole paths, pi resonance dipole paths, because what happens with these aromatic rings, and this is the basic for organic, chemi basic for organic chemistry, uh, they, they have three extra electron clouds, that's, uh, three extra electrons which form clouds above and below the ring, and when two of these get close, they attract by the van der Waals radius, and when they reach the van der Waals radius, they then oscillate in terahertz. 
So here you see uh, two benzene rings oscillating back and forth in terahertz, 10 to the 12th hertz. So you can think of this as a qubit of a superposition of both possibilities. You need two of them oscillating back and forth. And anesthesia, it turns out, uh, blocks, uh, blocks these dipole oscillations. They form dipole dispersion forces and stop the, uh, <coughs> stop the oscillation. So this is the unconscious state versus the potentially conscious state. Do you get the terahertz radiation from that? Yes, yes. Froelich? Froelich, uh, co yes, Froelich coherence. And something that can be detect detected with, with terahertz sensors, perhaps. I should point out also that uh, psychoactive molecules such as the neurotransmitters dopamine and serotonin have these uh, pi resonance rings, as do the psychedelics LSD, DMT, and psilocybin. Um, all, it seems that the psychoactive molecules uh, have these uh, pi resonance rings. So the qubit turned out to be, we eventually developed a qubit as a dipole pathway uh, along uh, one of the Fibonacci uh, pathways in the, in the microtubule oscillating back and forth and a superposition of both. So this is the qubit uh, that we settled on and it's, it's very similar to Froelich coherence. In fact, Froelich had a term for these uh, Froelich giant dipoles because they can extend uh, mesoscopically and, and macroscopically. So the idea was that uh, w when enough superposition and the gray means superposition, you reach a threshold given by T equals H bar over E sub G, and there's a moment of consciousness. And how many of these we need, we'll, I'll come back to. And then <laughs> new states are chosen, which can then trigger axonal firings and run the neurons. So this can interact with uh, the physiology within the neuron. So to quantify ORCOR, we calculated E sub G for tubulin in three ways. Uh, superposition uh, separation at levels of the whole tubulin, separated by 10%, separation at the level of atomic nuclei, separation at the level of nucleons. Uh, Roger gave me the equations, and uh, I, I did the high school algebra involved. It was challenging for me, but it was fun. And uh, what we determined was that the dominant effect was at the level of atomic nuclei. So not the largest and not the smallest, but in the middle. So that's what we used. And <coughs> It, it turns out that there are 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th tubulins per neuron and about 10 to the 19th to 10 to the 20th tubulins in the brain. Using this <coughs> equation, <coughs> we tried it for different times for <coughs> EEG, for example, alpha rhythms, which would be about 100 milliseconds. Uh, this requires a very long coherence time, uh, which is impractical, and required only a very few uh, tubulins, only 1 to 10 neurons worth. So uh, that didn't seem too logical. Uh, so we, this, we figured it must be a much faster uh, uh, process. So for, for example, at 10 megahertz, this has a favorably short decoherence time. You only have to avoid decoherence for uh, 10 millionth of a second. And you require a lot more tubulins, about 10 to the 15th, which is about 10 to the minus fourth or 10 to the minus fifth of brain capacity. So a 10,000th roughly of the brain for a conscious moment occurring uh, over and over. Now you might say, well, 10 megahertz is way too fast for cognition and consciousness, which it is, but interference patterns from terahertz to gigahertz to megahertz to kilohertz could resonate across scale and evolve to reach threshold at time t. So uh, in our 2014 paper, uh, we, uh, we, uh, voted, we went with uh, 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 a much faster uh, ORCOR time, for example, 10 megahertz, and came up with this multi-scale hierarchy that I showed before in which ter the terahertz oscillations that were anesthesia acts, and, uh, but with interference, you get uh, uh, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and then hertz and EEG. And we proposed in our 2014 paper that EEG is actually an interference pattern for much faster vibrations in microtubules, and despite the fact EEG has been used for 100 years, uh, we don't really know the big picture of what it signifies and how it all hangs together and what alpha, theta, beta, gamma have to do with each other. So we think it could be one system coming from microtubule oscillations, and Horacio Contiello has found gamma synchrony oscillations in, mi in microtubules. And, if, and further down, uh, it would ultimately hook up with somehow be influenced by uh, the space-time geometry and OR. 
Now, there's actually good evidence for this coming from Honor Bon in, in Japan, where he, in a number of experiments, looked at uh, individual tubulins and found terahertz oscillations, and then individual microtubule, and then uh, neurons, and found these triplets of triplets um, for terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, and then at the higher scale, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz, all the way up to EEG. So these are done with quantum resonances by putting four nanoprobes on a microtube using two to stimulate and uh, <coughs> two to record to get these, uh, these measurements. So here's what I said before, that we reach a threshold, bing. Uh, this could be 10 to the 15th tubulins in the brain for a conscious moment, and it happens again and again and again. And this could be looked at this way, that's actually related to what's happening in space-time geometry. And here's the schematic of one particular OR event. And our approach to the hard problem is more or less this, that in conventional approaches, the redness of the rose, or qualia, is due to some pattern of activity in a brain, an MRI shown here, which I don't think is correct. Or in our view, or my view anyway, I'm not sure if Roger agrees with this, that a particular pattern of space-time geometry out there in the rose is reproduced in her, in her brain, and that's what gives rise to qualia and the, uh, the, the redness of the rose and potentially solves the heart problem. So we can have a series of these events at a given frequency, um, say 10 megahertz, for example, and each one can send quantum information backwards in time. And, and that's the point of what I started talking about was uh, backward time and free will. So what would conscious free will look like? Because remember I said before that it appears that conscious activity occurs too late uh, for us to have uh, free will in real time. It could look like deviation from automatic reflexive autopilot behavior. It could look like non-computability. It could look like backward time effects. And Roger's retroactivity in OR can erase unselected curvatures, avoid the heat, which is a problem uh, with the Diossi mechanism and rescue conscious free will, implying that, bing, consciousness happened, so time is going this way, and the erasure goes back here, and uh, it, conscious experience could happen at the onset, or, or when, uh, as this is erased, pushing it uh, backwards in time, which means that uh, there can be activity uh, earlier than the, acti than the neural activity happening here, and consciousness can, can happen uh, earlier and in time to do, to hit the forehand or, or respond to uh, somebody in a conversation. So uh, Roger mentioned Libet's work uh, yesterday and Ben Libet, uh, shown here, who was at uh, several of our consciousness conferences, um, uh, uh, studied patients whose brains were exposed and he would stimulate the finger, as Roger said, or stimulate the finger region of the brain and talk to the patient and direct cortical stimulation would give you, without stimulating the finger, would give you uh, conscious experience after about a half a second, 500 milliseconds, where stimulating the skin of the finger would give, give an evoke potential and immediate conscious experience. But he did some clever, ex clever experiments, including thalamic stimulation, which gave an evoke potential, but then stopped, so you didn't have the ongoing activity there was no uh, 500 millisecond, there was no neuronal adequacy, and Libet concluded that there must be, uh, to, get, uh, to have conscious experience at the time of the EP, you needed both the EP and 500 milliseconds of activity and to reach neuronal adequacy, and then backward time referral to the time of the evoked potential. And when he came out with this, he was ridiculed by classical uh, people, uh, neuroscientists, uh, philosophers, and so forth, and uh, they kind of beat him down, and he kind of changed his tune, unfortunately. But uh, uh, I think he was right, and uh, deserves a lot of credit for that. And <clears throat> this could also apply to what I showed earlier about deviation from Hodgkin-Huxley behavior to get us out of the prob problem of being uh, algorith completely algorithmic and deterministic and computable. And this is in a paper uh, how, that I wrote, quantum, How Quantum Brain Biology Can Rescue Conscious Free Will. And, uh, uh, explain all this, and so the backward time referral can be, can be one of the things that contributes to the variability and where consciousness comes in and kind of supervenes on uh, autopilot, uh, uh, autopilot automatic processes. 
some other people comment. Jeffrey Gray talked about uh, how it's impossible to hit a tennis serve uh, uh, based on physiology. And Max Velmans talked about other things, uh, sensory and emotional content, uh, phonological and semantic analysis, uh, speech, learning, etc. These are all ha these are all problems because they seem to uh, the activity that supports them occurs after we've already responded. Consequently, the uh, feeling of control uh, is deemed illusory. Conscious, uh, consciousness being epiphenomenal and free will as non-existent. Uh, Dennett first said that Wegner and uh, many other people. It's kind of the de facto position uh, in, in neuroscience. So um, I think Ron uh, mentioned yesterday the uh, uh, the uh, color phi effect, and this is another example of, of parent backward time effect. So if you if you look in the screen, you see a red dot, and then it goes away, and then you see a green dot. What you actually or, or this is what happens, but what you see is the red, red, red turn into green halfway through, and you do this a bunch of times, but then you trick the person and go red, red, the person isn't fooled. The person knows that it's, so he or she would go, in that case, red, red, red all the way. So how does, how does this happen? So here's another way to look at it. In this case, the observer is looking this way. Time is going this way. First, he or she sees red on the left, then a little time later sees green, but, or is exposed to red and then green, but what he or she actually sees, if the timing is right, is, is red, red, turning to green halfway through. And then you do this a bunch of times and you try to trick him or her and make it uh, red, red, and he's not, he or she is not tricked. He knows each time that it's gonna turn to green or not. So how do we explain this? This is Dan Dennett's explanation that Ron mentioned yesterday. And what Dennett says is that, well, here's what happens in reality, but then after the fact, uh, we fabricate uh, this, this idea that it turned to green and notice this is uh, se several hundred milliseconds later, and it, so it's not in real time, and this is the memory that is encoded. And according to Dennett, consciousness is really memory that gets, that gets stored. There's no actual consciousness, according to him. Uh, that implies that we are living in the past and that real-time conscious experience is an illusion. Now, contrast, so here's Dennett's view, and here's our view in which uh, there's actually backward time referral. And so uh, the, the observer actually knows whether this is gonna be green or not and can't be fooled. So uh, the advantage here is that this is happening in real time, there's no delay. So if this were uh, a predator-prey relationship uh, in evolution, the, the, uh, the animal or person having the real time uh, uh, feedback, the real time knowledge would, would presumably win. So this is an advantage in, in evolution. So let me say a little bit about testing ORC OR. Uh, previous computer modeling on anesthetic done by, uh, this, by us, Travis Craddock was the lead author, modeled quantum dipole oscillations among all 86 pi resonance rings, going back to the tubulin molecule, and got a spectrum at KT, at ambient temperature, a spectrum of collective dipole oscillations with a common mode peak at, about, at 613 terahertz uh, in the blue light region of the spectrum. And, and the presence of each of eight different anesthetic gases abolished this 613 terahertz peak and dampened other terahertz frequency proportional to their anesthetic potency. So the more potent they were, uh, uh, the, the, the better they were getting rid of the uh, 613 terahertz. So normally it would go up. I won't go through all these, but all the anesthetics uh, abolished or reversed the polarity of the, uh, of the 613 terahertz peak and F6 and TFMB uh, are non-anesthetics. They reside where the anesthetics are, but they don't cause uh, a loss of consciousness. And flu fluothil causes seizures and, and uh, anesthesia. And uh, um, anyway, the 613 peak is, is here in the visible range. And uh, the non-anesthetic gases, as I said, do not cause anesthesia. They were discovered in this paper. Uh, they had no effect on the tubulin terahertz. Why not? Well, it turns out, that, okay, here's the, the two non-anesthetics. Uh, their MAC is very high, which means they're, they're, they're not, uh, not potent at all. Uh, but their oil-gas partition coefficient is such that they should be anesthetic. So what was different about them? 
It turns out that their polarizability was higher than the other anesthetics. And if the polarizability was too high, that meant we concluded that the non-anesthetics would, would uh, here's the oscillation going on, rather than the anesthetic uh, gumming it up and stopping them, the non-anesthetics were highly polar, polarizable and just kind of went along for the ride and didn't have an anesthetic effect. As far as I know, this is the only explanation for why non-anesthetics don't cause anesthesia. Um, <clears throat> moving along, we're part of the uh, Templeton program, Accelerating Research and Consciousness. Uh, Jack Jasinski, Arak Kalra, Greg Scholes, Bruce McIver, Aristide Dugario, and we have regular Zoom meetings that Roger sits in on. And uh, we're looking for quantum effects in microtubules at physiological temperature. We hope to then uh, plan to test effects of anesthetics to see if the quantum effects dampen proportionally, and also to test effects of psychedelics to see if uh, they enhance the quantum effect. I would predict that the anesthetics would dampen and the psychedelics would increase the frequency. And we haven't gotten that far yet. What we have uh, shown so far is that using fluorescent resonance energy transfer in microtubules at ambient temperature, we have found quantum excitons propagating 40 nanometers along the microtubules and persisting for at least five nanoseconds, which is a long time because a uh, previous record is picoseconds, right? And for the photosynthesis protein. So this is, we're really happy about this. And it's caused a problem because they want to uh, zero in on this and write a couple papers before we, we move on to the anesthetic, but we'll get to it eventually. So going back to uh, the, uh, the experiments that uh, uh, Anurban did to show, uh, this is further evidence um, for uh, quantum effects in, uh, in microtubules at these terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz uh, frequencies. Uh, it's, it's quantum up to here, uh, hertz perhaps not, and he called these triplets of triplets. And he, again, here's the multi-scale hierarchy, uh, which we could go that way up to the brain, four orders of magnitude, um, and there's a break between here and the, and the Planck scale. So let me conclude uh, by saying that, in my opinion anyway, Orca War is the most complete theory of consciousness and that it has more explanatory power, including free will, including potentially the hard problem uh, and others, um, and enables real-time causal control of our actions. Number two, in the brain, uh, consciousness is, is most likely in layer five pyramidal neurons. Uh, so we have a, a more or less specific place or, or layer that consciousness is occurring in. Uh, Orkawar connects quantum brain processes to the fine scale structure of the universe, granting consciousness an ontological status and suggesting an approach to the origin of life. I've recently gotten involved with the astronomy uh, people at the University of Arizona who are looking for uh, who are bringing back samples from an asteroid looking for organic molecules, much like the pi resonance rings I showed inside tubulin, but, but more complex actually, and, uh, and looking to see if they may uh, be the origin of life and whether they, they can have uh, quantum processes that can be anesthetized, for example, and, uh, and also give rise to consciousness. So it's not just astrobiology, but astroconsciousness. And uh, significant quantum processes in microtubules have been demonstrated and uh, further testing awaits. And uh, Orkowar suggests therapeutics, for example, treating microtubules for mental and cognitive disorders, uh, Alzheimer's being one example. And we've done, uh, we've done some preliminary work on that. And technology using graphene-based computing uh, for terahertz sensors, both for, uh, for looking uh, from outer space with the astronomy people, but also for biological uh, things that, that Pavo asked, because uh, if the terahertz uh, among the pi resonance groups is the origin of consciousness, uh, then it, uh, we don't have good technology to detect terahertz because it's in a gap in electromagnetic uh, detectors. So um, uh, it would be good to have uh, graphene-based technology for a biological and astronomical uh, examination. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Sabrina, yes. quick, we have to be quick questions. Okay, it's a quick question. Um, so, could collapse, so you, you, in, in a way, the role of gravity uh, is essential uh, in the framework of the collapse that you explained. 
Um, so if there were no gravity, there would be no consciousness according to this mechanism. But um, there would be other ways of explaining the collapse, um, like interaction with the environment, which arise from electromagnetic forces very, very often, really. So would it be possible to conceive, or would it be interesting, in your opinion, to conceive and to compare, really, benchmark um, with, with collapse as induced by gravity, um, uh, other models of collapse which are instead induced by other electromagnetic forces that could arise um, from, a, from the environment um, that naturally uh, interacts with these systems? I would say no, but I'll leave it to Roger. <laughs> well, the thing is that the, it's only gravity which really requires a change in, in the structure of quantum mechanics. Um, I mean, the argument I gave probably rather too quickly in my talk uh, shows that the principle of equivalence, which is the basis of general relativity, basically, um, is only, well, it's only an effect of gravity. You, you can fall freely and, and the gravitational force disappears. <clears throat> and you want to incorporate that principle into, <clears throat> into a quantum superposition. Now, electromagnetism you don't have this effect, so there's no reason why you have this to... This is true, but it, it, it still can cause the collapse, it still can cause uh, the disappearance of a quantum superposition of two um, distinct objects, in the sense that you, we do observe um, that, you know, due to interaction with whatever is the environment modeled as it is, uh, quantum superpositions become classical uh, statistical mixture. If we don't see why we have any... I mean, the problems with all theories that you get infinities and so on. So, but mm -hmm. but um, apart from that, which may be important, of course, um, I mean, here you have a quantum theory of, of uh, electromagnetism, quantum exactly. electrodynamics, and so that uh, you don't see this problem arising there. The problem arises with gravity. It's only with gravity that you have a principle of equivalence. And a this I, I completely agree, yeah. but from the perspective of the what happens inside the microtubules, where you have this superposition of two, so you, you assume that you have a superposition of these two different, um, let's say, it's well, the superposition in two different locations in space time. Okay, so in a way, the the transition, so the disappearance of this superposition, uh, may be uh, competing at least. Uh, with other effects which are not gravitational. This is. I'm sure they play a role. I mean, quite yeah. electromagnetic magnetic effects may be yeah. very important. So, so, I mean, when you consider eventually the time scale uh, which induces, you know, of the collapse, if you want, maybe um, understanding how it compares with respect to, um, you know, this, this sort of disappearance of a superposition which is due to the presence of uh, other uh, surrounding uh, environments which are, in this case are present might be mm -hmm. But okay, I see you is saying like cut, 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 no, and no, continue no. later. Yes. No, but let, let yes. me just say that also that if you bring in something else, electromagnetic, yeah. and deep environmental decoherence, that's going to uh, mess up the information processing. Mm -hmm. that we, mm -hmm. And well, it would be happening. Yeah. So, under those uh, circumstances, the consciousness would be protoconscious because it would be contaminated with randomness from the environment. Whereas in the microtubules, because of the nonpolar uh, uh, region of all the pi resonance, where you're excluding polar interactions, you're, you're excluding charge, and presumably the heat is pumping the co uh, mechanical vibrations, coherence of the microtubule. You've limited the degrees of freedom, so you're only oscillating in, in one direction, back and forth, and you get a, a pure, a more or less pure quantum state. And when it reaches collapse by his mechanism, it's all the all the information is contained. Whereas if it gets contaminated by electromagnetic, then you you've ruined it with something else. Well, but at the same time, what would you? I mean, in the frame, if you describe uh, the interaction with the environment in terms of quantum information flow from the system, from whatever is um, the, your system and the environment, you can have. Uh, um, a phenomenal backflow. So you can have situations in which actually the information the goes away from the environment but comes back. It can even oscillate between the two. So there are circumstances in which this information is not completely lost but can be even trapped. So it, this is in the framework of the electromagnetic forces. But maybe we can continue later. Like I yeah. anticipated precisely yeah. this phenomenon happening here. <laughs> and I don't know what faculty I used, but it is indeed the case that you will be able to continue this conversation yes. Okay. Yes. very directly tonight. Yes. Yes. It is not an accident. 
So, maybe Marilu, we take you. Oh, well, just a very quick question. Uh, it's a double-sided question. Uh, so, you uh, mentioned the fact that you needed a 10 megahertz. Uh, um, that was our, it doesn't have to be 10 megahertz. It's just... A, well, I mean, in order to, to, to keep up with the, with the decoherence. Uh, what about then a, the, something like meditating state uh, that, are, that also Julia was describing? Then they can fall into this description about consciousness. And uh, the, the other side of the question is, uh, you also mentioned the experiments where these uh, five nanoseconds uh, coherence uh, in the microtubuli has been observed. Uh, there are uh, data that can uh, 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 confirm this uh, uh, kind of coherence in the case in which you don't, uh, you are not looking at single microtubule as I think it's in these experiments, but you have. Uh, no, we're looking at ten to the fifteen tubules, which is a lot of microtubules. It's about a ten thousandth of all the microtubules in the brain. Okay. Tubules, mm -hmm. microtubules. But uh, in meditative states, for example. Um, if you just look at EEG, and I think EEG is related to the uh, megahertz by interference, uh, EEG gets faster. Uh, in a famous study at, at Davidson's lab uh, 20 years ago with uh, the, the Dalai Lama's monks, and uh, their resting EEG was like 150 gamma uh, hertz, mm -hmm. and, when, and their, their gamma went to 200, something like that. So they're, they're med the meditative meditate state, your EEG goes faster and becomes more coherent. And, and so that could be, the, now the content is something else. Uh, you, could, you can meditate uh, you know, or, and without any inputs and, and be highly conscious of just your inner state, whatever that is. I think Julia was talking about that. Or you could meditate or somebody could take a psychedelic in an amusement park and they'd have a lot of inputs. Uh, so they, their brain would be very active, but they, they would still be at a higher frequency, I would presume. I have a question for Stuart and Robert, which is that, so I think I understand why we need gravity, because I think we can kind of bake all the other fields into the kind of conception of a, the field theories we already have. Uh, but what is being accessed? So when this happens, I accept the mechanism, I accept the idea that something non-algorithmic is occurring, but my question to both of you is, what are we accessing, and how? what gets brought back to the realm of, let's say, the, the rest of the ontology, where we have, you know, Roger's theory, and I'm, I'm walking around and going on about my business. So, where are we accessing, and, and what comes back? It's because of the collapse of the wave function. I mean, that's, that's the key thing. And all these other things are part of standard quantum mechanics. So. You need something <clears throat> which is outside the standard quantum mechanics picture and which att attacks the collapse this year. And that's the whole point. And then, so that part I get. Yes. But what I mean in the way is that, are you guys suggesting in the way that, because you, you know, Stuart spoke about, let's say, intuition. So is it so that, you know, when he was talking about very large numbers, what is he accessing? Where, is the, where are those non algorithmic intuitions? Like, Where's that stuff? Like, where, where, what are we accessing? And then what comes back to the, now the Roger, your modified conception of reality, which is now this gravitized quantum mechanics. So I understand the role that that plays in, uh, as, as the mechanism of access, but what are we accessing and what comes back? Does, does that question make sense to you guys? If it doesn't, just well, say no and we can move on. <laughs> I, I, would say, uh, I would say that if you go back to the beginning, that you know, the three waves for sensory experience, that happens too late. Okay, forget the fact that it happens too late, but that's a, you know, let's say that's a reasonable uh, picture of the outside world, perhaps lacking qualia, you know, yeah. the hard problem. But, you know, it, it, it could be a non-conscious representation. And then the collapse brings in qualia, because I think that's the essential feature of consciousness. So the qualia, and Roger may not agree with this, but the way I interpret what he's saying is that, uh, is that qualia are, are somehow intrinsic uh, features of the universe and conscious experience. So there's some non-local information or something that this process pulls on, kind of a la some kind of Bohmian scheme or something like this. Well, it's very non-local, if that's what you mean. I mean, yeah. the, the collapse. Yes, it can't be just problem. individual particles. Yeah, no, for sure. We're talking about large structures, probably. But, but my point is somehow that somehow you have to be saying that 
you're encoding for insight in there somehow. So that that's how insight, non-algorithmic insight is brought to the, so this is... I think, I think we're trying to address questions much too... I mean, we're looking at the... Lofty, crazy. No, it's not crazy, it's, it's just that it's too far away from what we can address directly, I think. So you're saying there's structure, we're accessing it, like there's more structure, but nothing more yet can be said about it. And that structure carries insight, for example. Well, whatever insight is... Yeah. Well, it would argue, that's part of the argument, that whatever insight is, is going outside a purely computational procedure. Yeah. So, I mean, think about what uh, these larger uh, the things about the numbers. Uh, yeah. I mean, th these are conceptual things, yeah. and you have to have understanding, and these are different from what pure computation is. So it's, it's, there's no understanding in what the computer does, it just computes. <laughs> just following the rules. Yeah. But you have to have something outside that. Um, I mean, exactly what it is in detail, we're, we're a long way away from yeah. I'm only saying that, that you need something like that. I totally agree. Yeah. This is exactly what I... Yeah. So you Thank can't you. really answer the detailed questions. No, no, you, what, yeah. Yeah. Understanding is a feeling. The, the way I look at that is that understanding is like a, a qualia or a quail. And that's when you know something. And what I heard is that we're a long way away, but maybe one day we can understand oh, sure. what's there. But it's, that's it's, it's accessing point. something outside the, the pure computation. Yeah. And that's what you need. Exactly what it is going on is a much deeper question. But we can one day maybe get to Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That was fantastic. And let's go get lunch.